Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to <coughs> today's Prosperous Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Wednesday, the 22nd of March. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Councillor Charlotte Atkins to the committee. Um, we're going to look forward to your, your uh, membership on this committee, and I know that you'll be, you'll be brilliant. Um, we've also got Sam Thompson, but she's had to send her apologies today. Um, so we'll go straight on to the agenda. So um, item one is apologies, Jonathan. I have apologies, Chairman, from Samantha Thompson and Philippa Hayden. Thank you. Are there any other? I think everybody else is here. Yes. Um, any declarations of interest on anything on the agenda today? No. And if everybody presses F1 at the top of their laptop, it will save me having to listen to all your emails coming through. Thank you. I won't turn your mobile phones onto silent or off. Graham. <laughs> uh, item three, minutes of the last meeting held on the 3rd of February. Are we taking those as a true record of events? Can I have a, a proposer, Graham? Seconder, Philip? And we'll get straight on to item four, which is the Staffordshire Community Learning Services Annual Self-Assessment Report 2021-2022. And I'll hand straight over to uh, Councillor Philip White, Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Economy and Skills. Good afternoon, Chair. Nice to see you. My phone is turned off um, and I have pressed F1, um, I think. So um, it's good to see you. So. Um, this, this is an annual event, and I know most of the committee members are quite familiar with the content. Um, this, is, uh, this is a very important part of our skills and employability offer. As, as the County Council, we, um, we utilise £1.6 million of funding annually, which comes to us from the Education, Skills and Funding Agency, um, to deliver education for approximately 2,000 adult learners around the county, um, achieving about 3,000 enrolments per year. Um, on an annual basis, we carry out this self-assessment of our performance, so looking, um, looking backwards at, um, at what we've achieved during the year, drawing comparisons with previous years, um, but also looking forwards at areas for improvement. Um, happily this year, um, we've also benefited from a visit from Ofsted, um, which happened only a, um, only a few short weeks ago. Um, and I've been, uh, I've been waiting um, very eagerly for the report to be published so that, so that we'd have the opportunity to discuss it here today, and happily it was published last week. So that in external assurance has um, married up very well, I think it's fair to say, with our, um, our, our self-assessment of where we are performance-wise. We, uh, we got a good assessment um, from Ofsted, although they don't, um, they don't subdivide the goods. I think the feedback evidence is that it was a very strong good um, which, uh, which shows that our delivery is, um, is, is, is really there for our, for our residents. Um, there are some areas from improvement which are picked up in the report and we're happy to talk about, but I think, um, you know, I think we, can, uh, we can also afford to, um, to consider some of the success that's in there as well. Um, with that, I'll, um, I'll hand back to you, Chair, um, to, um, to get, get, the, uh, get the scrutiny going. In earnest, I know um, I know Amanda's keen to talk through some of the fine detail of what's in the report, and I'm at your disposal as well. And we've got Tony as our backup um, if uh, Amanda and I can't manage to answer any of the questions. Amanda, do you want to come in first, and then we'll go to um, scrutiny questions after? Sorry, thank you. Um, yes, just building on um, what Philip said there around our <coughs> self-assessment, it is um, a continuous self-assessment throughout the year as well, so we're being informed each term of when we are um, delivering and we stop and review at that period and then have a, an overall annual um, review of our performance. So we've closely monitored our performance as well and focused on um, the outcomes for learners. Um, that was a, a request from scrutiny previously as well present more evidence of that as well. So um, the Ofsted inspection as well came at the right time at the end of our self-assessment period for that year. And um, we submitted our self-assessment and, and they agreed with our self-assessment. So that gives us confidence as a service and as um, 
um, team members that we know our service, we know where we excel and also where we need to improve. We'd identified some key areas around leadership and management and the strong partnerships that we've got with um, our providers that um, contract with us, but also the wider stakeholders across um, Staffordshire. And we've also got uh, expert teaching staff within our providers that deliver, that fully support our adult learners to learn um, specific skills of interest for them, but also develop um, significant significant benefits in terms of um, health and well-being in the wider skill development and Ofsted, Ofsted actually um, had long discussions with us about um, those wider benefits that the learners um, achieve on our courses. Um, sorry, just lost my thread there. Um, so in terms of some key, key outputs that we've achieved this year, um, we targeted um, the majority of our provision in um, wards, targeted wards um, at our most vulnerable learners. So predominantly those that have health and wellbeing issues around mental health and also um, learning and physical disabilities. And approximately 50% of, um, uh, of those learners actually declare that they have that difficulty as well. Um, and the a majority of those are actually um, within our supported learning curriculum and our STEM. Our STEM is accessible for all adult learners um, in Staffordshire. However, we focused it on those with mental health um, support needs, which I think that's a really big strength of ours as well. Um, our um, adult skills provision, um, we've had fewer learners within that, within that provision. We've had some um, delivery issues associated with long-term effect of COVID but we're in a situation now where we're recovering from that. Um, but those learners that do enrol in that provision, they do, they do achieve their qualifications. Um, we have learners that are on courses that are not specifically um, digital skills, English or maths. Those skills are actually embedded in, in the courses and those, a high percentage of learners can actually recognize that they are developing those skills. And just moving forward, um, and as recommended by Ofsted, that we need to focus down a little bit more um, in helping our adult learners develop those sk skills for the future early. Um, but we've already made steps towards that in our new um, framework that will commence from 2023 onwards. Um, a lot of our, well, 30% um, of the learners that were looking for work and were unemployed at the start of the course have moved into employment. And we have um, a small proportion that move into volunteer um, opportunities. Um, the learners also get the opportunity to explore different um, activities and projects that are in their local community and they're encouraged to do that by the providers that we work with, so they know their communities very well. Um, we talked about um, learners developing their personal skills, um, and that comes from the support that they get from um, the tutors and the, and the learner, learner support assistants as well. And those um, learners as well also report that they become independent in their learning or, or develop independent skills for everyday life. And many of our um, courses have a, a strong focus on healthy lifestyles. Um, and we incorporate things around five ways to help health um, to well-being. And um, learners report that they um, they feel physically and mentally well as an impact of being engaged in their course. And learners um, know how to protect themselves from radicalization and extremism. And a high percentage uh, report that they feel safe in their learning. So we have a, a strong focus on safeguarding and our safeguarding processes are effective. And then just one thing that we did um, take part in in that year was a, um, um, a, a family learning um, building brighter futures award where we were shortlisted and got some recognition for some of the work and innovation that the providers had done so we 
we were quite proud of that. Although we, d we didn't win, but we were shortlisted, so it's a step forward for us because it, it just shows how our family learning has developed over the years as well. Um, and the Ofsted inspection was a tremendous experience for um, my team, the county council, and also for um, our partners and more so our learners and the feedback that we've had from our learners who engaged <coughs> with the inspectors, it was quite uplifting for them and they had the confidence to talk to a professional and sort of describe the impacts on their life. So it was a um, positive experience all around. Thank you. Anthony, have you got anything you wish to add at this stage? I, I think ju just to say really that, you know, this is uh, an annual process and we appreciate the sort of scrutiny and support from the, the committee in terms of what we, d what we try and deliver. I think some of the, the points Amanda's picked up about the continuous evolution, and particularly over the last couple of years since the pandemic's been really important. And I think some of the issues that are being faced in the labour market today, you can see where our provision makes a real difference. Um, there's a lot of talk about economic activity and particularly older workers coming back to work. Most of our learners are, are you know, uh, 50 plus, um, particularly, <coughs> particularly if they're male. Um, but there's not enough males. Um, but equally, a lot of our learners don't have a level two equivalent, so they're not up to educational attainment levels of school leavers. And so this is really a provision to get people re-engaged and, and back on the ladder and back into work, build their confidence and help them with their family and their lifestyle as well. So that's what we're trying, trying to achieve through, through this provision. And so it's 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 one of it's appreciating where we fit in that market so that's really important to us uh where where you know other providers don't operate thank you okay we'll start with the questions charlotte thank you chair um excellent report thank you very much and i was glad that i had the briefing from you earlier um sometime earlier mandy uh, long before i was on this committee um what I haven't got quite out of the report is what is the typical learner journey? Um, your colleague was saying that most of your learners are perhaps over 50. Um, presumably someone will Im Im embark on a course. Will that lead to more courses? What is the typical time a learner will spend with the service? And I also see that digital learning, unfortunately, seems to be below target. And particularly given the pandemic and how we increasingly relay, relied on digital learning. What is being done to resolve that? And thirdly, I saw that both South Staffordshire and my own area of, St of Staffordshire Moorlands seems to be lacking in terms of providers. And I just wondered what you were doing about that and why those particular areas have problems with provision. Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the learner journey, it'll be different for each learner because um, we focus down on their goals and aspirations for the future. Um, in previous years, we've l really limited the amount of learning opportunities that an, an individual can have with us. But because we um, focus all our funds and our courses on targeted learners, the most vulnerable as well, we provide um, four learning opportunities and do have some flexibility over that as well if the learner's not quite ready to progress say into something more formal as FE college or um, further training elsewhere or even volunteering in employment. The length of the courses vary as well so um, a learner might come initially and engage in a 10, ha 10 hour course, it might have been digital where they started and then they might have real when we continue to work with them find out what their career aspirations are or their you know everyday life aspiration is it might be that they then progress into some stem provision which might be up to 60 hours and then they might have another 20 hours of something else as well so it's about um, making it bespoke and tailored for that individual um, and also the providers that we actually work with they have progression routes onto other projects as well um, so you know we continuously look at that journey from start to finish um, and, and when we're doing our planning as well we look at the um, progression opportunities and we've actually said in our self-assessment report this year we want to do more more on that as well 
Um, in terms of Staffordshire Moorlands, um, you'll be pleased to know that we have another provider delivering in Staffordshire Moorlands. Um, you will see an increase in enrolments and participation, participants <coughs> in Staffordshire Moorlands in this current year. Um, we are on a four-year framework. You know, we may have started with 30 providers on that framework with events that have happened throughout the pandemic. They are not either set up to actually deliver um, online blended face-to-face -face, or they've had to prioritise their core business as well and they've decided not to contract with us. Um, we haven't offered it out to other providers that are on the framework because then that risks us um, having a negative impact on the quality experience for the learner. So we've um, focused on our good providers that can reach out and provide a good to outstanding experience and increase those contract values, hence how we've managed to reach out into Staffordshire Moorlands now. about your target wards how do you decide on what your target wards are so that comes from area an area data matrix Indi indices of deprivation <coughs> mm -hmm. sorry sorry so we use the <coughs> indices of deprivation to identify those wards that are most disadvantaged across the, the county and that's where we direct uh, providers to work in terms of their local engagement or we offer our, our provision so it does it does map into where, where those disadvantaged communities are. And you then link, uh, link in with local colleges in those, in those particular areas? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, obviously a linkage with all the providers across the county. So we work primarily with uh, voluntary and community organisations who can do that grassroots engagement. Um, but then we're able to then make local links to uh, other learning providers, whether they're the college or the learning environment. So that forms part of the information, advice and guidance that a learner might get about the next steps once they complete their, their courses. Interestingly, over the last couple of years, we've seen uh, FE colleges in particular move away from working with our provision and focusing on more leisure type courses that willing, people were willing to pay for. Um, but now that we've introduced the Multiply programme and the emphasis on numeracy, we've actually consciously made efforts to build links with all of the FE colleges across the, across the, the patch uh, so that they can have that, that link progression route then from our, our engagement and the learning that they'll do to a certain level with us around numeracy, but then can, they can then step on to not just courses around numeracy, but wider wider skills and other adult learning programs as well. So there has been a shift in the market there um, that, that we sort of try to respond to, but also direct our provision towards. <coughs> Philip, did you want to come in? I did, thanks. So just, just on, the, on the policy aspects of it, and it as, as you'll know, and as the report draws out, th this is an area where there's been a lot of change over recent years, and we've had to navigate that change. Um, and particularly getting that, that balance right in terms of where, where provision is delivered um, and whether that's physically or virtually and get, getting that right um, with the goal being that we make it as easy to access services in a way that's beneficial to people as possible. That, that's the goal. Um, the targeting in terms of, in, in terms of those, those areas that we target um, it is based on the principle that you, you can't target everywhere to the same extent and we, we, we think the evidence is quite strong that those are the areas where there's the greatest need. Um, and in terms of outcomes, we don't want to be too prescriptive. So the outcome may be that you enjoy doing the course, um, which, which benefits your well-being. Um, it, it may be that it reduces your isolation, it builds your confidence to, to engage with, with further activities which might be learning or employment. Um, but there is a there is always a very, very clear um, pathway from whatever you're doing into something that would represent progression um, towards doing more. And ultimately, our, our goal is that we have more people who are, are in employment, um, have higher skill levels, um, so are probably going on to a course at one of our colleges or elsewhere. Th that's always our our gentle preference, um, but we, we don't want to be we don't want to be too forceful with that because the engagement is the key and recognising that people come to adult learning for their own reasons and we, we, don't, we don't want to um, unintentionally put barriers in the way of them getting the benefit that they can accrue from it. So it's, it, it's getting the balance right, but with that, with that pathway very clearly marked always towards 
towards doing more. David. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm interested, um, I commend the report. I'm not offering a criticism of what we have, but I'm just simply questioning that um, because of the nature of Staffordshire, um, if you take Cannock, Burton, uh, Burntwood, Burton, um, my own division of Litchfield Road or South, Tamworth, and then come up to Burton, um, we don't solely rely on Staffordshire. A tremendous amount of our uh, young people, particularly, will work across the border. And so the cross-border relationship is quite important to us. Um, and I just wondered um, how we were coping with the need to have um, a, a cross-border relationship that provides a service where, uh, for example, in my own division, um, if you want further education of some sort, you would almost certainly go to Walsall, um, for better or for worse. <laughs> but that's the opportunity that, that, that we have. And I wonder how we were coping with that. Thank you. So in, in terms of the adult learning service, the, you, we, we, our, our funding is to, is to deliver courses in Staffordshire, as you would expect, and so that, that's focused on Staffordshire learners. In terms of progression and those relationships um, with providers outside the county that people might, might choose to progress to, so you know, Walsall College being a, one of many good examples of that, we work very hard at making sure that those relationships are, are well developed, that there's a, there's a, re there's a regular um, more than communication, a regular engagement um, with, with those organisations. Many of them come into Staffordshire as well um, to, um, to, to deliver within the county, and so we, we're always very keen to make sure that that works well. And in terms of progression, which I think is, is where your point is, so people who might receive um, a service from us but then want to progress elsewhere outside of the county, um, I mean, I can ask Amanda and Tony to speak to that, but I, th I think we're pretty well rehearsed in doing that and helping people facilitate that. And really, it's about the needs of the learner, isn't it? So if the, if the course that suits them best sits outside Staffordshire and we can help them get to it, that's what we'll want to do. And I think we, we can evidence that quite well, can't we? Amanda, you're nodding uh, reasonably furiously. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so all our providers, uh, um, learners, sorry, are provided with um, information, advice and guidance. Um, and it's very much focused on the aspirations of that individual. So if they want to progress out of Staffordshire, then um, the teaching staff and the provider that we contract with will actually um, make contact you know, with the relevant organisation to support that progression as well and give the, the, the learner some um, information for them to make informed decisions about what they want to do in the future and how they go about it. So they're they're given the knowledge and the understanding on how to support their own progression as well. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we're always sharing information with learners, you know, what's on the boundaries, you know, of, of Staffordshire, what's within Staffordshire. Um, some learners will say, but I, I know that's available, say, in the Moorlands and I live in South Staffs, you know, let them info um, speak to us and identify where that demand is and where possible, you know, to support that progression. We'll step in if we can do as well. I, I suppose, Chairman, it's not in the remit of um, this particular debate, but um, <laughs> I, I find with the people in my villages uh, that if you don't have your own transport, the possibility of doing something outside the community is nil during the daytime or evenings. Um, but I suppose that some of the learning is actually remote learning through computers, but I, I don't know. I think we do need to address remote villages. Yeah, yeah so that's that, that's that question about right-sizing the delivery. So we, we had to be all digital during the pandemic. Um, our, our, our preference now is face-to-face -face where, where that's most relevant, but we want in the blend of what we're offering a good amount of digital to, to address that point and other points. So you, even if you have got access to transport, it might be for whatever reason it doesn't suit your life to have to have a journey each way to get to the, get to the course that you want to, um, you want to participate in. So it's just getting that balance right. Um, and um, you know, I think you know, the, the, more, the more rural you are, the more that, that might be a benefit to you potentially, um, not least for the reason you've mentioned.
Graham. Thanks. Um, huge fan of this service. I think helping the bottom 25% who have got very few qualifications and struggle with literacy and numeracy is actually vital for the country. Otherwise, they're totally left behind and having 25% of the population left behind is, is terrible. And what I, so what I want to ask, though, is you talked about the number of people that go on to employment, which I think is fantastic if we can get people into employment who have struggled previously. What extra help? Do we have links to... Uh, employers and you know, how, how do we help them once they've completed a course to get into employment? Um, for me, that seems to be a crucial part of this. Thank you. So if I may, I'll answer that first and then I'll, I might ask Amanda to provide a little bit of detail about how, how the support works. But yeah, um, as far as I'm concerned, that, that, that's the primary point of this. It's helping as many people as we can um, to get to where they want to be in their lives. And we know that there are a lot of people who've, who've always struggled in terms of, um, in, in terms of isolation, um, lack of opportunity, and lack of confidence to, to do more. And I think the pandemic has, has, has really um, grown that problem. And there are a lot of people who've withdrawn from, from the workforce, um, many of whom might, might like to come back to it if they have the confidence to do so and the skills to do so in some cases. So th this is a very easy way um, for people in those categories to get started um, but it's 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 the progression that's the important thing and that's why that's such a strong focus in terms of our development goals here um, so in terms of progression to employment um, we do we do work with um, job center plus is obviously the uh, the, the most obvious um, uh, partner for that but but there are a number of others as well so we we, we do a lot of that work in terms of our um, our services here at the County Council, we've also recently launched our jobs brokerage service, and that's a really important part of that ecosystem. So linking employers who have vacancies with individuals, including our learners, um, through the adult um, community learning service, um, and with skills providers, so that we can take people, particularly perhaps the sort of people who might engage with this service, and link them up with those things. Um, and a lot of the other services that you'll see, they'll link an employer with a job, but the, the, you know, the, the skills bit, either the employer or the individual has to sort out, and that's often a barrier. Um, so that's slightly broader than the adult and community learning service, but it's very much part of what we are now doing um, and, and trying to fill the gaps in, in the provision that's out there, which is what, as a, as a local authority, we'll be, we should be seeking to do, not replicate the things that others do, um, but deliver the things locally that, that others aren't and are needed. Um, just, um, if I may, Amanda, in terms, in terms of the specifics of how we work with those partners in terms of that progression to employment, could you just speak a little bit to that? Um, we had a provider event this week where our providers that deliver um, our community learning all came together, and we had um, the, brokerage uh, the brokerage team there, the job brokerage team, and by the end of that meeting, um, they'd got um, invitations to come out and meet learners as well. They saw that as very beneficial to our adult learners. So that demonstrates that, um, one, our providers that we work with see the value in a service to support learners moving forward into employment. So I'm sure that will go strength to strength and we'll need some timetabling and some planning um, moving forward. And um, I, just, I just think it's a, a, a great opportunity for, for our learners. And then in our current tender um, that's out at the moment, for those learners that are going to be engaging in the STEM provision, we're asking that the providers have a strong working relationship with employers because those learners are closer to the employment market than our other learners. Those are further away. So we see, we're planning it within that journey where we want to get the learners to. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that develops moving forward, but I think it can only go, it can only strengthen those progression routes into employment and, and volunteering as well. Philip. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, excellent report, and Councillor White will know that uh, 
I have special educational needs and disability students at, at heart. I, I do work in that field in Derbyshire. So it's great to see that we're supporting people. And the people in the 50s who are coming to us for help, it goes back to years ago when they were classed as naughty and they didn't get the support in school. So they left school with no qualifications, feel that they couldn't do things. Whereas today, it's all more inclusive. People can do things if they want to and with our support. So that, that's really good. And it's great to see that we're encouraging people to come forward, learn new skills, pick up the skills that they need to do jobs and get them into employment. So that's very positive. So to realise our aspirations of going from good to excellent, what ideas have we got for the future? Because it's good, we've got goods, but we can always improve. So I think the first thing that I would, I would just offer a bit of a challenge back to is how do we define excellent? Because we, we, we could define that as getting an outstanding rating from Offset next time. Um, and one of the good things about Ofsted is that it provides that external quality assurance, and you you do get you do get good areas for improvement. Um, but I'm less worried about. It's, it's essential that we have a good rating. That's very important. But I'm less worried about getting an outstanding rating from Ofsted than I am about driving the outcomes that we want for our learners. Um, so, for me, our, our key areas of opportunity in go, going to excellent, and maybe it was implied in the way you pose your question because you didn't use the term outstanding is excellent to me is that we are even more focused on the outcomes that our learners want and that we're, we're making sure that we're constantly checking back in terms of how are we delivering on on their priorities in terms of what they want from their learning but also have those priorities changed and making sure that we're always keeping up with those learners because I think it's true to say that a lot of the people who engage with this service go on quite a journey during the time that they're with us. Um, so it, it's that, it's making sure that we're always tracking the outcomes that those people want and helping them with that um, and getting to where, them to where they want to be on that journey. And then, <coughs> as we've said, um, I think quite clearly, we have a gentle preference towards those outcomes for those who aren't, uh, aren't in this place when they start, um, that they, they're achieving higher skills and that they're achieving employment if they're not currently in employment. Um, but it's the learners' priorities that are our, our key, with those preferences being there in the background as you know, thing, things that we know are important. So hopefully that answers your question. Oh, sorry. Um, just in previous inspections and different frame, inspection frameworks, they could report on good and outstanding features. Now they don't do that, and the reason why they don't do that is because if they're looking for consistency across the board, so um, for us to move to outstanding, um, I need to um, draw on the professional discussions that I had with the lead inspector about our outstanding features. Um, so I know what our strengths are, and what, you know we need to maintain those, but then I'm looking for consistency across all our contracts, all our providers, and across all our learners in terms of impact and, de and delivery as well, and making sure that our learners can recognise their own progress and achievement, all learners, the more able learners, the less able learners as well, and um, just continuing to have high expectations of our service. You know, th We are ambitious, and we're ambitious for our, our learners, um, and um, I think that is that is the approach, is making sure that we're very positive and forward thinking with our, with our learners and the provision. So I, I just um, have gone down to the, the relevant section in the Ofsted report, which is what, what are the areas um, where, where the provider can improve. And it really, it really speaks to that. So there are, there are four areas that they've identified. Um, and those, those are around us work, working as, um, as, as providers, tutors, learners to set challenging learning goals um, that, inc that encourage progression. Um, recording and recognizing that progress, particularly because sometimes it's quite rapid. Um, so that's my point about you know, things do change. Um, making sure that Engli English and mathematics skills are embedded in everything, which is, again, sort of geared towards those, those goals of higher skills and progression to employment. Um, and making sure that improvement actions are clear and precise. So again, it's the, the precision bit I think is really important to me and clarity um, around what are the outcomes that we're looking for. So uh, you know, I think Ofsted are quite aligned with 
um, the, what, what they found in our service is quite aligned with our direction of travel and where, where we want to improve. Um, and I know, Amanda, you, you very much want to get that out, outstanding and you know, quite right too, but mm -hmm. it, it's the outcomes that that indicates that are the important thing. It's, you know, it's, it's not the badge per se. Um, so hopefully that adds a little bit to what's already been said. Reverend Michael. Thank you, Chair. This is going to be fairly brief, I think, because the previous question really followed the line that I was hoping to follow. But just uh, as an aside to that, um, I get the impression that the experience of Ofsted itself was fair, supportive, constructive, um, and generally good. And it would be good to hear that that was the case. Amanda, I think you have the right to go first on this because you were our, um, you were our accountable person for this, weren't you? So you were in the sort of in the sites mainly, but I'll, I'll speak to it as well in a moment. Yeah, it was a, a tremendous experience um, for the service and for, for the County Council and um, just for everyone involved from the moment we had the telephone call from the lead in inspector, the planning conversations when the inspectors turned up, they were very um, supportive and approachable and highly experienced around adult learning they understood um, what adult learning sets out to do especially community learning um, they, yes they have a, um, a, a strong focus on skill development and progression but they could they truly understood um, the other well-being issues and health implications that our learners have and all the challenges um, so it was a great experience to actually engage in professional discussions with with all the inspectors um, it, it was it was a, re a really great experience and I'll, I'll I'll just add to that um, is the um, governance is part of the inspection regime so I have my time with the inspector as well um, I couldn't agree with that more in terms of in terms of the feel of the experience but you, you feel the rigor um, and you feel that sort of burden of responsibility not to let the side down in terms of your contribution to that um, but it was it was a very a very good experience um, for the team. Hard work, but good experience. Interestingly, I'm a I'm a school governor as well, and we we had Ofsted in last year, and I'm pleased <coughs> to say the school got a again a, a strong good. Um, but we found some of the experience a bit less satisfactory in terms of how the process was gone about. Um, so you know I understand the pur the purpose of the question, um, but. Um, yet yeah, the outcome was good in terms of the inspection report, but the process we found really helpful um, and not unpleasant. Thank you. Um, really pleased with this report. It's always it's always a good one to read, um, and excellent news on the Ofsted report. And I hope that we'll have a nice big press release going out with, with uh, and shouting about your successes because, you know, we don't get enough um, praise for what we do well. Um, just one quick question. Um, obviously, when our learners go into that employment, do we then catch up with them in, say, three or six months' time? We don't just leave it them with the employer, or are they out of our hands then? Um, no, we don't do that um, as standard, but maybe that's something that we could consider. You know, look, if we've got capacity to do that and a process um, to do that, but we do get some learners that actually get in, in touch with us and they, they'll say, um, you know, do you know, or um, I, was, I was out visiting um, sessions earlier this week. Um, I shouldn't say stumbled across, but it was. I stumbled across a, a learner that um, I knew from so many years ago and um, employed, started a young family, you know, got a young family, married and... You know, she was actually saying she thought that was out of her reach, you know, back where, back in the day. Um, and also an, an, another thing that I saw this, this week was intergenerational learning within family learning. We had grandparents um, attending sessions with their family members to support them to steps to employment. Um, so, and you've got the children there as well. So it's just quite nice for the children, young children as well, to see parents, mum and dad and grandparents engaged in learning and le it puts le it, learning's important isn't it to, to everyone um, so that, that was quite nice to see as well so again steps to employment but yes we could monitor it when they have moved into I'll take that forward I was just going to say I remember um, my daughter bringing home maths homework and I thought I, did, I didn't do maths like that when I was at school you know how many of you how many of us have used 
pie since we left school. I've eaten a few, but I've never used pie. Um, so, <laughs> steak and kidney, yeah. Um, so I do think um, one of the ideas going forward is that we could monitor how they are going on once they've got that employment. Because it, it, it could be a success, but on the other hand, it could be that they've gone into the employment and only stayed a few weeks, but then where did they go after that? So I think it's important that they've gone through that process, that, that journey, and we need to know where they are at, 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 at X point um, uh, and to see where we could have helped them if, if, if we needed to. So that put, would be one of the ideas I would suggest going forward, committee, that um, we monitor that progress where possible, because obviously I'm aware that capacity in all our departments is stretched. Um, so I just think you know that, that would be a good idea for us to monitor where, where they go once they leave that learning program. So if I may chair, I think, I think that that's a very good point to raise and we've, we've talked a lot about progression, um, but it, it, it's, not about, it's not about the service per se, it's about those people's lives. So I think there is something, something there that we can do fairly efficiently and we, you know, we, we've got email addresses for all of these people, if nothing else. We have had an issue historically with um, people who sort of finish doing whatever they're doing with the service and, and, and keeping in touch with them. Um, so it's, it's something that we are aware of um, that we, we'd like to get better at anyway, um, because whilst some of those people, their outcome is, we know they've gone into employment. Um, yes, you're right, have they sustained that? Um, they've gone on to for, you know, education with another provider. Have they, you know, have they taken that on to whatever outcomes they want? But with some people, they, 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 will, sim they will simply finish a course and then they're gone and we don't hear from them again. Um, and um, it would be good to, to know what all of those people are doing. And you know, if it's celebrating successes, then that's wonderful. If it's actually saying, oh, do you know what? Actually, maybe we could help you again, then that would be, uh, that would be good as well. Um, so we will take that forward. Um, the other thing that I didn't get the chance to say, and I was hoping to find a, a moment to crowbar it in, is just to have on the record a huge, huge well done to Amanda and her team um, okay. for not only the, the, the outcome of the offstep, but all of the hard work. Um, particularly over the last three years that's built towards that. Um, it bears saying, and um, uh, I, um, I think you can feel rightly proud of what you've achieved. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further comments or questions, um, the recommendations are that we scrutinise the performance and quality assurance of community learning commissioned and delivered through the school's community learning team as set out in the annual self-assessment report. I think we've all had the chance to do that and offer ideas and suggestions for future focus or areas for improvement for the council's community learning offer. Are everybody happy that we've, with those recommendations? Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you, Philip, Anthony, and Amanda, for your time today, and well done. Enjoy your success. So we'll just wait for David and his team to settle. And we'll move straight on to um, item five, which is Staffordshire Safer Roads <coughs> Partnership. And it's Councillor David Williams, Cabinet Member for Highways and Transport. <coughs> Afternoon, Chair and members. Uh, just a quick one. I'm, I'm only going to do a little introduction then in Mel who will be going through most of what, what we do as a, the uh, Safer Rise Partnership. So it was formed in 2001 and aims to support local partner organisations working together to improve road safety around Staffordshire. The new governance and delivery structure was implemented in 2016 and it's intended to provide a greater level of scrutiny, include political representation, ensure a true partnership approach is maintained with equality across all partners, and enable more effective multi-agency collaboration. collaboration. Staffordshire Police, Fire and Rescue and Crime Commissioner and Dep uh, Deputy and both the Crime Commissioner and the Deputy both uh, undertake a joint role as Chairman. And the SSR, SSRP and its partners use a range of measures to address road safety, including education, community engagement, enforcement and highway engineering. 
Regular presentation to the Prosperous Over and Scrutiny Committee provides us an, an excellent opportunity for scrutiny by the County Council as one of its partners. I'll hand over to Mel to uh, go through it in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Committee. Um, the partners of the Staffordshire Safer Roads Partnership are the, uh, the County Council, Stoke on Trent City Council, Staffordshire Commissioner's Office, Staffordshire Police, Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Service, and also National Highways. The partnership isn't an entity in its own right, it's an informal collaboration, and the aim is to be able to bring resources, knowledge, and skills across all those partner organisations together um, to help us to improve uh, road safety. The new governance and delivery structures, as Councillor Williams has mentioned, that were implemented in 2016 have un undergone some further review and development, and we've implemented some supporting strategic documents. Um, one of those is the Partnerships Memorandum of Understanding, which is, um, I think it's been included as Appendix 2 um, in the report, which helps to just support some of the mechanics of the partnership, how we operate in terms of employment on behalf of the partnership, um, how we manage um, the finances within the partnership. That's in draft format at the moment. We had a partnership board meeting yesterday at which um, we were moving <coughs> to get that finalised and, and uh, signed up by partners. So we're getting very close to having that implemented. We have a partnership governance board which is currently meeting three times a year. Um, I've included the current board membership as Appendix 1 within the report. Uh, we have representatives from all of our partner organisations and we do have political uh, representation now from the County Council, the City Council and the Commissioner's Office. Supporting that governance board, we've got a number of working groups which we're in the process of um, expanding. So the, um, the aim for these working groups is to allow partners to work together to develop different work areas and bring proposals to the governance board for their uh, agreement and support. One of the examples of uh, a, a recently convened working group was to look at community speed watch, which is a very key activity for the partnership and I know very key amongst our, our communities and their representatives. And we've been looking within that working group at how we can better support those community speed watch groups to make sure that they can undertake their activity safely and effectively. Um, and we've been looking at improving the links they have, for example, to their local policing team um, members that can give them additional support uh, when they're out um, undertaking activity or to support where um, significant issues are identified. The partnership's main aim is to improve road safety across Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent. We've adopted an aspirational Vision Zero um, approach, but in real terms we're seeking to achieve a long-term sustained reduction in collisions. Collision data analysis is very key to drive the work that we do and to understand where activity should, should be focused. Um, a single page summary has been provided as Appendix 3, um, which I think you've all hopefully seen, which just gives a really good oversight of the sort of work areas that, that we feel we need to focus on. Um, many of those key road user groups will be very familiar to the committee and most of us will have an understanding of the sort of risks that are posed to many of these groups. The um, last item on that list is not specific to any particular road user group, but is generally looking at some of the high-risk contributory factors that we, we find within collisions. Now, within the, um, within the um, various different factors listed there, we find that speeding is, is the, the highest one that we see represented most often, followed then by alcohol, drugs, and then failure to wear a seat belt. So we're very interested in continuing to develop our work in these areas to, to ensure that we're having the maximum impact on protecting road users um, and ensuring road safety. There's also a footnote um, on that uh, single page summary which, which underlines the, the benefits of, of focusing on those different factors, which is that altogether um, the road user groups and the high risk contributory factors relate to over 80% of all collisions that, that result in injury and over 90% of those that result in death or serious injury. So it's, it's a really um, sort of important area for us to, to, to focus on those different elements. Several of them are very well established already. Other areas we're looking at developing, um, such as mature road users. I've uh, included in the report several key initiatives for the partnership. Um, and I'd just like to highlight a few of those. In 2018, the partnership took on the funding of road safety education in schools. This was a service that was previously 
supported financially by the local authorities. The City Council had had to cease their operation um, some years previous, and the funding was under sort of question within the, um, the budgets available to the County Council at the time. So the partnership was able to step in and, and take on that financial support to ensure that road safety education could not only continue, but could also be um, continued equally across both uh, the County Council and the City Council area under the partnership. We have a small team that are employed through the County Council who deliver that service on behalf of the partnership. And during the 2021-22 academic year, they delivered to over 18,000 pupils. I've mentioned Community Speed Watch already. Um, I'll move on to communications and media activity, which is an area that the partnership is very keen to develop. We recognize the, the potential for using communications and media to um, focus on campaigns and, and promote road safety messages. The County Council provided a commission service for us a few years ago and we're looking now at implementing um, some specific <coughs> resource within the partnership to help us to develop that further and undertake uh, additional work. We're progressing plans to upgrade a number of our older fixed, um, fixed camera sites so that we can start making use of newer digital technology which will provide sort of great benefits in terms of the back office process. We're hoping that we're going to have some uh, newer sites um, upgraded later this year and for those that we we find that are detected speeding or committing other traffic offences um, often there's an option for them to be diverted to one of the national driver offender retraining scheme courses such as the speed awareness course uh, these courses are delivered in Staffordshire by Staffordshire County Council on behalf of uh, the partnership and um, Staffordshire Police um, the courses have been found to be more effective than issuing fine and points for these, um, for certainly for the sort of lower level offences. So they're an area of activity we're really keen to support and we're really pleased with the delivery um, that's achieved through the <coughs> County Council. Uh, a recent audit by the national body responsible for the courses found that Staffordshire's provision was ov overwhelmingly of a high standard, so that was uh, really good to hear. So in summary, the partnership would not exist without the ongoing commitment and support from our partners. Um, in particular, their role in delivering road safety activity is key to us achieving our aims to improve road safety. And we're grateful to the County Council for the, the part that they play in this, uh, along with all of our other partners. Thank you very much. Anybody got any questions? Uh, Philip? Yeah, I noticed that in the uh, <coughs> statistics, we're a couple of years out of date. And um, since COVID, my experience, and I do a lot of riding of uh, advanced level motorcycles, I find that since COVID, a lot of people have forgotten how to drive. And a lot of, I, I'm just wondering, has, it, has this impacted on our number of collisions that we've had? Um, I mean, I welcome the fact that um, we do train. Uh, I mean, I'm more interested in motorcycles. I'm a member, a fellow of the Institute of Advanced Motorists. And I think our bike sense uh, cap is brilliant. And, you know, we, we not only train new riders, but we also train the born again riders, which I see is one of our statistics of 46 to 57s, where they have motorcycled for years, had a big break, and then come back and think it's still the same. Because, but it's a lot different. I, I've been riding since 19. 75, and I've noticed how road conditions today for motorcyclists are completely different to what they were, you know, 40, 50 years ago. But as I say, I look at the statistics there, and I just wonder, you know, can we have some up-to-date ones as soon as you can to see if has there been a difference? Because, uh, I mean, I ride for the blood bikes. I have a, a bike that's got um, fluorescent colours on. Uh, I wear a fluorescent jacket, but I still get people keep pulling out on me all the time. But thanks to my training, I can see what's happening but I really feel that the standing of driving throughout the country has gone down a lot this last couple of years and I just wondered if that's had an impact on our on our figures and um, the other thing is that um, I set up speed watch in Detoxeter and we have some great volunteers we have speed indication devices which are quite expensive I wondered whether the county could look at in the future perhaps giving some grants towards doing that because I know a lot of parish councils want to put them up in their villages, uh, but the cost is quite significant and they're finding it difficult to, to pay for it. I know that when, you know, being a county council, I helped the top of the town council fund theirs by giving them half the money, but that, that's something to look at. And I welcome uh, more um, help from Staffordshire Police uh, with the local policing teams to come out and help. 
the speed watch teams um, because we do have problems occasionally and they send us a PCSO but they have no powers to deal with uh, what's happening and the other thing is um, uh, what was I going to say uh, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute um, the letters that go out do have a big impact on the people that are caught by speed watch I went to a parish council meeting last week and a lady said that um, her She'd had one, and her relative of her had had one of our letters had gone, and it had a big impact on her. We only send letters out to adjoining um, areas. A lot of people that come through Utopsy that we catch on one of our main offending roads are not from within the area. Why can't we still send them a letter saying, you know, you've been caught speeding in this part of Staffordshire, it's not right? Because it's, it's a very well-worded letter that got there, and it, and it did make people think, oh, I've been caught, but... Because when we get our figures back <laughs> and we look at how many people we've actually caught and then we look at how many people, you know, we actually get a letter, sometimes it's quite a lot less. So perhaps in the future we could look at sending them, you know, nationally because we have a lot of people go to Alton Towers or come through Utopsity on the way home and they offend but nothing happens and I think it should. But uh, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, those questions. Um, um, I'm, I'm pleased that you've, you've had some involvement in some of the motorcycle initiatives that we undertake through the partnership. I think they're, they're really worthwhile and, you know, as, as the priority road user summary indicates, they are, they continue to be a really key um, area for us and there are um, some other aspects that we, we've been looking at developing around group riding and um, sort of first aid and casualty care for motorcyclists. So it's still an area that's very key for us. Um, regarding the collision data, um, we have uh, sort of referred to it within the report that there have been some changes in processes around collision data recording by Staffordshire Police um, and there's a certain process that's involved in terms of the collisions being reported, completed, passed through, validated, um, that's undertaken by local authority colleagues before it comes through for reporting. So uh, currently we've only got complete and, and fully validated data up till the end of 2020 which is what, what I've included in the report. We are keen to get that data m much much more up to date and there are there is work in place through the police and, and links in with the partnership to do that. Um, we did see a reduction in, in 2020, no doubt to do with, with the pandemic in terms of um, a reduction because there was a reduction in, in traffic um, during those lockdown periods. However, we did get a lot more contact from communities that were concerned about traffic behaviour at that time. Um, and I think some of that's, that's continued. Um, we've yet to see if, if there's been um, sort of an uplift from there and, and whether the um, some of those sort of concerns you've raised about whether people's driving habits have changed since that period. Um, I think it's something we need to keep an eye on, certainly, and look at responding to. We do look in, in very deep de detail at collision data so that we can understand who's involved in those collisions, the causation factors, the locations, um, so sort of everything that we can to try and identify where there are those trends that we can perhaps address through partnership interventions or, or work that our partners can undertake. Um, regarding um, funding for speed indication devices, the partnership did have a community grant fund that operated a couple of years ago and we did fund quite a number of, um, of those type of devices. Um, it's not something at the moment that we're, we're intending to um, release further funding for, but I think it's something that we'll certainly keep on the radar. They're very, very popular with communities and I think that they could be very effective with, with um, drivers as well. So it's certainly something that we're um, supportive of, but we'll have to consider whether we can apply future funding for that. I think the initial rounds there was around £200,000 of partnership funding that we put out so that was quite a chunk and, and we're looking at, um, at sort of other priorities currently for our, our funding that's available. Um, uh, last couple of questions I think were about community speed watch. Um, so the links through to the police although the local policing team are quite key and often as you mentioned that is PCSOs that have limited powers we do also have officers that are trained to use handheld enforcement devices at the roadside that can go out and support or undertake additional activity um, to the um, times that the community speed watch groups are going out. And we've also got strengthened links in with the roads policing unit as well um, at Staffordshire Police that could go out and undertake enforcement activity. So it's an area that we're developing. It's an area that our speed watch volunteers have said that they'd really like some more police support. And we're looking at how that can be achieved we're always up against that, the limited resources and the priorities that, that the force have, um, but they're very keen to support, so we're just looking at how we can um, sort of do that best going forward. Um, and uh, the cross-border issue, um, I'm aware that there's been some discussions recently with Derbyshire Police 
uh, around a reciprocal arrangement um, so that uh, if we're issuing letters uh, and it's somebody who needs a home visit, they'll undertake home visits if they're in Derbyshire and we'll undertake home visits if, if they detect people that are in Staffordshire. And we're hoping to sort of spread that further, um, uh, you know, certainly to, to bordering areas and, and beyond that if we can, because it is, it is a key area, um, I think, you know, to, to make sure that we can maximise the impact and not be you know, omitting people just because of where they live. So thank you. Yeah, my experience of, road, of, of driving is it's poor observations and planning that, co that cause most of these collisions. And you can see they're not looking around, they're not planning what they're going to do. Um, and a positive note is that the road policing to team, as I think has uh, tripled over the last 12 months. I know the inspector and sergeant personally, so um, I do am able to get their help. And yeah, they have got this... Uh, very expensive handheld device now that they can use in areas where we can't get the camera van. So it is very positive and uh, hopefully, you know, as you say, we're developing now. Um, I know during COVID that the road policing team weren't able to cope with traffic they were dealing with, helping with the response. Now they're back doing their main job, which is policing traffic issues and that's what we need to do. So thank you. Just, just coming in on the point about <clears throat> the fact about the, um, the speed cameras as well. One of the things that I know we, we did in our parish, we share it around several parishes. So, because not everybody's doing it at the same time and actually getting people trained so that can then, that machine can be used in different areas is also a, a good way of making sure that you can do it if you haven't got that equipment as yet. Charlotte. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I certainly um, are pleased to see greater support for Community Speed Watch. I do know that finance can sometimes be a barrier um, or having to share equipment you know with a neighboring group so I do hope that uh, the community speed watch groups will be pointed towards possible areas where they can get funding indeed even county council community funds for instance because I know that you know 400 pounds or whatever it is um, can be a big hurdle for a relatively small group who are giving up a load of hours um, to support safety in their own community. Um, I'd like to ask about the upgrade of the older fixed camera sites um, because I know that how frustrating it is for people who have a fixed camera in their midst but in fact it never works or it's never switched on and so <coughs> if you could say a bit more about that because I know that certainly people I've spoken to in my own division of Leek um, find it very frustrating that um, that lorries will thunder past them and over what they perceive at least to be over the speed limit but there is no um, camera working uh, within that particular housing so be interested to know what you're doing in terms of uh, new technology and the upgrade of uh, fixed camera sites thank you thank you um so we've been considering which areas could could benefit the most from the newer technology and we've been working through on a priority basis how we're going to um, address those sites so we're considering particularly how effective the existing fixed cameras have been um, and looking at the sort of longer term collision trends in those locations we've also been reflecting on traffic speeds as well um, at uh, many of these locations um, it's it's a um, I think it's sort of well understood that that fixed camera enforcement um, rarely means that all cameras are, are enforceable at any one time and we do um, you know put a certain focus on the deterrent effect that, that camera housings can have even if they're not operational at that time um, we have had um, done some reviews of, of speed data at some of our camera sites that haven't been operational for some time and found that, that traffic speeds are still very compliant so I think you know one of the things we're very careful about with this sort of project is ensuring that we maintain that deterrent effect as, as far as we can um, so we, we, are, we are cautious about discussing the, the specific um, status of, of cameras um, and we will be um, uh, you know, monitoring all the sites and, and looking <coughs> at the sites that we think would, would benefit most from upgrade uh, or from use um, based on main on collision statistics but also taking into account some of the feedback we get from communities as well. The sad fact is that many people who speed are actually local uh, to their own communities whether they be lorry drivers or, or, or whether they, they be car drivers, um, or indeed, in, in, in one case, tractor drivers. Um, 
who, who, can sp who will speed in a particular location because they know that there's been no camera working there for years and it becomes relatively well known. And so therefore the deterrent factor goes out of the window when that knowledge is, is shared um, within the community that particular cameras haven't, had, haven't been operational for months or years. So I do think that a regular review is important um, simply because we will lose the deterrent factor um, in terms of local people if um, those uh, cameras are never operational. David? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got several points, really. Um, I'm particularly concerned about um, the relationship between Staffordshire County Council, police and the county with adjoining authorities. Uh, I have a road which goes um, alongside my division and um, we have now had, I think, four fatalities on this road but because the road falls within Walsall, um, we struggle to get data and information about what's happened. Um, I have a DHP meeting tomorrow and uh, we're struggling to get information about a cyclist who was killed in the last four weeks on this road. And if we can't get the data, we don't see how we can actually make progress in doing something to make that road safer. And we need some sort of better working relationship with adjoining authorities. Um, also, um, I'm trying to bring forward an area traffic regulation order <coughs> where I have um, a particular ward within one, of, within one of my parish councils where we are at the moment. I have the entire data of the main roads that pass through my division so that we can monitor whether traffic is increasing or reducing, particularly monitoring what's happened with COVID because this will be the yeah, third set of information that we've had. So we have all the information to be able to look at how we can put together a traffic plan that would improve the situation of the villages. That's extremely difficult to put together. And I can tell you that my DHP funding is now running two years behind um, on what we've agreed to do and the actual work being done. And I know we have staff pressures, but at some sort of stage, I need to make some progress. And bearing in mind I'm doing this in junction with uh, two of my parish councils, they think that we are um, just dragging our feet and not interested. Um, I would also mention, together with the parish council, we looked at a scheme which would have um, recorded um, speeding vehicles and it could have been made to automatically produce letter warnings. It's not a prosecution, so it doesn't worry us as far as uh, whether it's legal to do it because we're not prosecuting from it. We had a meeting finally with the police and they said that they were not interested and weren't prepared to support us over it. And so it seems to a degree that what we're doing at a high level within the County Council is taking a long time to filter down to the local member and how the local member can work with his parish council or her parish council. So I, I think we need to address that, Chairman. Um, in terms of the, the cross-border concerns, um, and, uh, and sort of access to information. I, I think if, if you've got some specific issues, if you'd like to contact me outside of this and, and um, I, can, I can see if, if I can assist with any, any linkages there, um, you know, very happy to help um, in any way that, that we can. I think, you know, the road, road safety doesn't stop at the border. Um, and I, I think this is something that, that does, um, you know, crop up sometimes that we, need, we do need to work together with, uh, with agencies um, to, to sort of over that line. Regarding... Um, Sorry. Jim, I'd be awfully grateful if you could send me your contact details um, because I suspect I won't find them amongst the mass of officers that we have. Um, and um, 
regarding the point um, on the sort of automated community speed watch equipment, so I, I can recall the discussions that, that we had a few years ago regarding that device. The, uh, the working group that we've developed with Community Speed Watch is looking at technology um, as, as one of the areas. And we are looking at, at whether there, there is a way of, uh, of perhaps reviewing that type of equipment um, for use in the future, whether that's by communities or whether that's sort of centrally. So it's certainly something that, that's still on the radar, I think, at the moment. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll, s we'll see how that uh, develops. Can I just come back? What we've looked at in the past is how we're going to cooperate with parish councils. Parish councils are awash with money. I was at one of the smallest parish councils within the whole of Staffordshire last night, and they signed off a reserve of £20,000. So if we were looking at how these things could be funded in conjunction with parish councils, I don't think it has to be a financial problem. Uh, I think that the county can cooperate or the local member can cooperate with the parish council if we have a scheme that we could operate. Um, we, we mentioned the uh, uh, automatic registration of numbers and the possibility that you could send automatically letters out from that and also multiple, multi monitor multiple offenders. Mm -hmm. That is quite expensive to buy. But if we put it to the parish councils, um, I think the money is there for them to be able to fund that. So may maybe as part of our discussions, we could talk about how we might be able to do that. My division is at the fountainhead of Staffordshire, heading into Walsall and Birmingham and to Wolverhampton. And uh, we get everybody that wants to go in that direction, comes down through my division, and possibly a lot of them past my house. So we're... I would welcome being able to have a discussion with you. Thank you. Chair, just, <coughs> just on that, obviously not, not every parish council is awash with money. I think a lot of them are very uh, frugal with what they do. But there are schemes that are out there, such as the, the speed indication devices that can be used. Uh, and there are lots of speed indication devices, such as the ones that I've we've purchased for my little uh, ward. Uh, in Sarden, and, and basically that takes traffic data, so which could be downloaded by Bluetooth, but it doesn't cross any of the problems with the GPDR, which is where it comes to with registration. So that you, information can then be shared with things like this. But I think when it comes to DHP and parish councils, they're a separate measure from this, unless it's an actual scheme that needs to go in through the, the Safer Roads partnership, to which I think that's where the, the member would be coming and speaking with the partnership itself. Ross. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just going back to the data briefly, if I could, in the report. I think it's on page 83. There's a, a graph there, which is actually quite pleasing, that does show a, a, a pretty consistent trend uh, in improvements in terms of collisions. But within that data is the serious collision data. And if you were to extract that separately, it's, it's a very different story. And there appears to be, over the last decade, no significant improvement. In fact, you could argue, possibly, as a ratio of slight um, collisions, that seems to be getting worse rather than improving. So the vision zero is important, but that seems to be a long way away. And I'm just interested in your observations as, as to why you think that isn't improving. And I guess back to the old adage, if you keep doing the same thing, you get the same results. What are we hoping and trying to do different to, to target the serious collisions and the deaths, which obviously are at the forefront of most of our minds, um, on the back of the fact that the slight collisions are trending downwards, but the stuff that should really concern us doesn't appear to be. Thank you. Um, one of the um, aspects to note around the um, classification of, of collision severity is that um, guidance periodically changes regarding how collisions should be um, classified. So I'm aware that from um, 2015, I think, it was, I think it's in the, yes, from 2015 there was a change in, in how um, serious collisions should be classified, which resulted nationally in an increase in the, the volume of, of serious um, collisions. So I think, um, you know, with that in mind, I think we're seeing, you know, particularly from 2016, we're seeing that proportion, you know, as you mentioned, increase. And then we're starting to see that, that proportion, hopefully, sort of decrease in, in recent years. Um, I think with, with some of the changes in, in processes around Staffordshire Police, I think it's, um, 
it's difficult to have that comparison year on year at the moment and we're, we're trying to achieve a, a st point of stability where we can really understand the direction of travel. But what we do do regardless of those overall trends is do those sort of deep dives into collision data with a particular focus on, on serious and fatal collisions to understand why they're happening, who they're happening to, um, and, uh, and continue to, to develop and work towards reducing them. So, um, you know, I, I agree that, that you know, at, at first sight it's, it's not looking um, overly positive for the fatal and serious, but I think there's, there's a lot more that's going on behind that, I think. Um, and I'll look forward to, to hopefully bringing some, um, some more comparative data to, to future um, committee meetings. Yeah, I, I did note the comment about the data and the, and the way it changed, and I accept that that's, that's quite reasonable. But even so, over you know, from 27 to 2019, on the same metric, the data's hardly moving, and yet the slight collisions are, are decreasing. So there's an argument there that actually the percentage of serious incidents as a percentage of overall accidents is increasing. And I'm just wondering if, if what we're going to try and do different to, 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 to alter that trend and to reduce that trend. And, and as you say, the, the data beyond COVID may be more positive, but that data isn't particularly encouraging over the last from 17 to 19. You know, the, it, it's at best flatlined. Um, uh, and we should be, as you say, if we're moving towards vision zero, that seems to be a, a long way away as an objective if we, we're not actually impacting that data currently. I think, I think when you're looking at the, the, the different types of data, we have to be realised. Obviously, Staffordshire is quite some of the safest roads in the country, so our actual numbers aren't high. Uh, that doesn't detract from the fact that we're trying to reduce the amount. But sometimes, I've got to be honest, especially from my background, you would be surprised at where accidents occur and why they occur, because it just doesn't seem to be any reason for it. Um, I think the advent of newer, faster cars, the, the people have think have got more protection. All of these things are being researched at the moment um, to look at why those are. But we're, we're trying to look at that research with the group. And obviously, if there are things that we could do to implement uh, or, or being well, we, we will do. But I, I think we do have to be careful in the fact that, yes, we're not reducing the percentage, but the numbers are reducing dramatically. So that's something that's really a, a positive rather than just, an, a, just a slight negative. Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, Picking up on a point that um, has already been made about some of the speeding cars are local, Councillor Atkins made, um, I do recognise there's a huge difference between a dense urban area like my division and a nice country area. Um, and there's different types of driving, etc. In dense urban areas, you get people parking on corners and only police can do something about that. Um, uh, PCSOs can't do anything, nor can um, uh, parking attendants, whatever they're called these days. So one thing that I do, people complain about speeding, or particularly on the rat runs in, and I'm sure this is the same in every built up area, that people complain about rat runs in built up areas. and. I've spent so much money on having uh, surveys done of speed and it comes back, yeah, yes, it's 0.1% of speeding, you know, 99. I explain this to residents and they say, oh, no, they're still speeding. It doesn't, because they can't see, even when I publish the data and give them the data, they don't believe it. And I think the answer to this is more camera vans in built up areas. Uh, we see them, plenty of them in rural areas, um, particularly in dangerous bends and things like that. But I don't really, I, I've never seen a camera van in my division and I've never seen a camera van actually in Newcastle on the line in the, in, in the built up part. You know. So I was wondering, is there any chance, I know there's limited funds, but just having a blitz, and uh, I think if people saw a camera van, they say, oh, they're taking it seriously. Uh, it's just a plea to try and, you know, get, I, I can't, I, I try to encourage them to have uh, joined speed watch groups. We can't have SIDS in a lot of urban areas um, because the, uh, if people complain, you've got to move the SID. And people complain every time they flash. Uh, I've been through this as a, a leader of a parish council, and uh, oh, 
almost physically attacked because a SID was flashing into somebody's bedroom window. And if, so in urban areas, the SIDs will be going off all the time, just flashing all the time. And I've tried to get SIDs, I've got funding for SIDs uh, from companies in my area, but um, uh, you get, Mel, your team comes along and says, oh, I'm sorry, you can't have one there because um, it's not a, an appropriate place to have it. So uh, uh, I'm reduced to um, chevrons and slow on the road, and that's it. That's the only... Uh, if I can't get residents to join a speed watch group, I try to encourage them, uh, but no. Um, so I think the only answer is occasionally a, uh, a camera van in, uh, in, uh, it, on the rat runs. Not everywhere, just on the known rat runs. Thank you. Um, I, th I think the aspect which you know you, you clearly described at the beginning is is one of the challenges for us, and it's public perception, um, and um, and you know we, we we see this sort of time and time again that communities or the representatives come to us, and you know they're seeking enforcement support, but actually the the traffic data um, you know doesn't support that it's a significant issue. In some areas it does, and, and I think that's that's what we need to to be very aware of is that there's there's a whole scale of of speeding issue. Um, you know that we can experience out on the roads and, and the focus for enforcement for the camera vans is on those sort of higher level mm -hmm. issues so we do have criteria that we apply based on the 85th percentile speed um, and where we've got those very borderline issues that don't meet the criteria um, currently we, we won't support um, speed camera enforcement and we will promote things like community speed watch um, there's also the wheelie bin sticker scheme as well which potentially is um, beneficial in urban areas because um, on on, uh, on bin day, you've, you've got all the wheelie bins with all the, the speed limit signs on, which can be quite a good sort of visual reminder for motorists. Um, but we do need to, to focus that, that enforcement resource in the highest priority area, the highest risk areas. Um, and unfortunately, it's a conversation that we have with, with communities frequently as well. Um, I, I understand the challenges um, sort of around this, but unfortunately, we have, we have to have that criteria in place. If I can just come back on the bin stickers... They are amazing. We did the whole of the Watling Street bit of Tamworth. And on bin day, all you can see for three to four miles is 30. And it goes a whole, all on the same side of the road. So they are quite impactive. Um, the only issue I have with camera vans is the first person that sees it, within 20 seconds, it's all over social media. So they don't kind of work. And then you get them coming down the road, flashing you to tell you there's a camera van at the top. So I know that's illegal now, but... Um, just, just a quick one on that, though, Chair. Actually, if they're all slowing down, it's done its job. Because it's not, we're not actually there to actually catch yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. It's done I its know job. we're not there to make money out of, out, of, out of speeding motorists. But I always say, at the end of the day, if you're not speeding, you've got nothing to worry about. So, But the, I just wanted to, 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 if anybody wants the bin stickers, um, Michelle Shaker, who heads up um, Community Speed Watch at Staffordshire Police, will just give you a whole roll of them. I don't know whether you've got them, Mel. Um, yeah, Michelle Shaker had loads of them, and I've still got some on a roll. If anybody wants some spare ones, um, and and to add that, um, you know, contact through to the partnership, we can we can link you up uh, with Michelle as well. So if, if anybody would like them, you know, for their area, um, let me know. Come through the, the main partnership contacts um, or direct to Michelle, wh whichever is easiest. The the road does have to be. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Means tested. What? No, it's not means tested. Um, What's the word? Risk assessed. Risk assessed. That's the one I'm looking for. Before you can put the 38 stickers out, to be fair. David. Only a quick one, Chairman. I, I'm very optimistic that my discussions with Melanie are going to produce some, uh, something really special. I would simply say again, Chairman, that if all the people that speed on a particular road are monitored during daylight hours through a system that will produce letters of warning, if we've got people who are multiple offenders and get a visit from a policeman to give them a warning that if they are continually uh, breaching the speed limit, they will be prosecuted, then we would dramatically reduce the number of people speeding on a particular road. Because in most cases, it's the same people. It's a, it's a police officer these days. Um, any further comments or questions? 
No, okay. Oh, Graham, that was a bit of a resounding no. <laughs> I think he's, think he's had enough. Okay, so the three, the three recommendations that we've got, I'm not going to read them all out. You've all read them. Are we all happy with that to note the emerging guidance, to note the purpose of the LTP, review and comment on the approach? All happy with those? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Mel. And Mel, I'll make sure that Councillor Smith buys you coffee and cake for that meeting because you'll be there quite a while. Okay. <laughs> so we'll move, move straight on to um, item six, Staffordshire Local Transport Plan. It's a busy day for Councillor uh, Williams today. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. So the council is now required to produce a local transport plan and this is going to be our fourth local transport, transport plan since 2000. Uh, the local transport plan sets out the council's vision for the transport network together with the policies, plans and programmes of schemes to deliver that vision. It's in two parts, the first part being a long-term strategy document that describes your authority's vision and policies, probably covering the period up to 2050 which is the date by which the UK economy must be net zero. And the uh, second part is to delivery plan covered by a period of five years. It will set out the schemes to be developed, to, sorry, to delivered and to ensure that we're on track to meet the LTP's vision. It's going to be reviewed on a rolling basis. The local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, the plus service improvement plan and electric vehicle charging strategy will be updated and appended within the LTP. And the integrated transport strategy for each district will also be appended and consideration will be given as to whether more specific theme-based strategies are needed. The current LTP was published in 2011 and does not reflect these changes and challenges facing the Council. Transport planning has now moved towards a more integrated vision-led approach and new technologies provide alternate transport modes and alternative physical trans to physical travel. DFT published the draft LTP guidance last September and we're still waiting for the final guidance which we are confident that we will focus on uh, prioritising sustainable travel, transport being an enabler of economic growth, ambitious response to climate emergency and delivering carbon reductions and that I need to highlight the fact it's carbon reductions, it's not an offset, this is a carbon reduction part and then ensuring that the network is safe, reliable and inclusive. Much of what the Council already does to maintain, enhance and support the operation of transport network networks remain relevant, however, reacting to the changes and challenges that I've alluded to will require a change in how transport is delivered and this will require everyone to act differently, with greater emphasis on supporting modal shift and managing the demand for road space. The LTP's vision will describe what Staffordshire's transport system will look like in 2050 where there'll be two subdivisions, one for Staffordshire's towns and one for its rural areas. Therefore, ongoing public and stakeholder engagement, including uh, with hard-to-reach groups, will be key to the LTP's development as it will manage expectations and ensure buy-in. In terms of the government's arrangements during the LTP's preparation, a project board will be created providing overall direction and management. It will compri comprise of myself and senior managers an internal project team comprising officers will be doing the doing group, pulling together the, the LTP, and an external working group comprising of organisations representing the public, private and voluntary sectors who will act as critical friends steering and supporting LTP development. We're unclear with the new LTP needs to be published. Indications suggest it will be sometime next year. As this doesn't give us much time, we're keen that officers can start work on a new LTP and the committee are asked for their comments before work begins in earnest. And I have two very, very uh, knowledgeable people here. Should you have any questions? Thanks, Chair. Any questions? Okay. Ladies, did you have anything you wish to add? Oh, she's go on. She's pressed the button. Okay, I think I'd just like to uh, make the point that. The local transport plan runs till 2050 and it will be heavily focused on modal shift away from um, combustion engine vehicles. 
Um, this needs to be quite significant, but I think it's worth pointing out that the LTP will be a long transitional period to 2050. We're not saying we want change immediately. Um, and we know that the electric vehicles are going to be coming on online soon and, and a lot more people will have them. And then sort of linked to that, um, this local transport plan won't be scored by the Department for Transport, but what they will do is look at our quantifiable carbon reductions. So we will have to demonstrate that we are making real um, reductions in carbon from transport and our funding will be dependent on that going forwards. Charlotte? Given that the uh, local transport plan um, wants to achieve modal shift, um, originally the, the plan seemed to be, a, in terms of cycling, is just to focus on commuting routes. Will that plan then engage with increasing cycling at more local levels rather than just looking at commuting routes between, between major centres of population? Because there are all sorts of ways that <coughs> cycling could be encouraged, not least along our canal towpaths, for instance, but also within towns themselves, if facilities for cyclists were expanded um, to make it a more pleasurable experience to um, cycle within our towns rather than taking out the car, particularly for relatively short trips. Uh, and indeed to encourage um, you know, cycling ac across our parks where responsible cycling uh, would be encouraged. So what is going to be in the local plan to actually encourage local cycling rather than just cycling to replace cars in terms of commuter routes? Okay. Um, I think so far um, our sch schemes that we've uh, delivered in terms of cycling have been based on the criteria that Active Travel England have given us in terms of what bids we can put forward. But I believe that the local transport plan um, will be our opportunity to put forward what is the right solutions for Staffordshire. So I think they are looking more at um, um, cycling as the health, uh, health benefits. And I think this is our opportunity to put forward what, you know, what we should be putting forward as a, for a rural county um, in that local transport plan. You know that, that many cycling groups see, uh, see that in the past it's been a lost opportunity to encourage cycling mm. from relatively young ages but also people uh, at, a, at an, older, an older age as well. Uh, it seems to me that we should be encouraging far more cycling. I mean, not just across, you know, the sort of cycle tracks in the space like the Manifold and Titusworth and so on, but really looking at making cycling along... Um, country roads uh, much more appealing and to encourage um, you know cycle training as well if, if I can chair yeah I completely agree with what you're saying Charlotte unfortunately when it comes to DFT uh, criteria for when we're applying for the funding a lot of rural areas don't meet the current DFT uh, requirements and that was something I actually took up with the Minister for Roads several weeks ago personally with the fact that you know, we, when we're wanting to apply for grants to be able to provide um, cycling routes, they don't fit our criteria. We've been very fortunate to have Annabelle and her team who've actually worked with the DFT to get the ones that we have been able to get, and we've just been successful in another couple of smaller ones. Um, uh, so I think the thing, the thing now is when it comes to the LTP, this is going to be our chance to say this is what we'd like to do, this is how we'd like to provide it, and then we're hoping that DFT and the ministers are going to listen to what we're saying so that they can change their criteria and when we're applying for different routes, we'll be able to get that finance. A former um, Minister for Local Transport Plans and Cycling, I know exactly how the DFT works. And uh, that, as, you, as you know, then we, we don't fit the criteria, so uh, hopefully that will change. Just on cycling as well, I'm all for cycling routes, but I do think we need to have protected cycling routes. Cyclists are very vulnerable on some of our very busy roads. You're not likely to see me on a bike, but I wouldn't go on a bike on some of the roads where I live. Be scared stiff of take, being taken out by HGV. Um, so I do think we need to. I, I agree with what David's just said because I know how hard we worked on the on the, the last one of these, and um, Annabelle and her team to get the cycling routes where where I represent. So 
but I do think we, we need to look at protected cycle routes because they are so vulnerable on our road schemes. I have to agree with you a lot with respects, but obviously we do, do sometimes due to literally the rural nature or the actual design, it's very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. But also remembering that we're not just <coughs> talking about cycling, we're talking about cycling and walking, it's yeah. active travel. Uh, and it's so that we, we are, there are many schemes that we, or proposals are out there, but it is getting that funding to be able to develop them in the right ways. Uh, but I completely take your point. David. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I, I, hopefully I'm about to uh, join up with a local developer who is going to uh, produce the second uh, electric charging station in uh, the county and the first one in South East Staffordshire. So I think that will be yeah, a tremendous move forward and I'm working with your officers on what we're doing with that. The second point that I would come to is um, planning is not joined up. Um, the district councils consult with the county but don't actually, yeah, at the end of the day, recognise what the implications are of what they're doing. Um, when you look at funding for roads, uh, the funding that comes out of a development does not fund the consequences of what the development does. So you end up, and I will talk about my own patch, where there is massive amounts of development in Litchfield that is now producing tremendous number of vehicles that are rat running through the local lanes. That would bring me on to the fact that um, because of the rat running, I do not in my division have a single road that would be suitable to put a cycleway on. Uh, we have a tremendous number of cyclists. It's a very, very popular area for cycling in our lanes. But the lanes are uh, a potential death trap because there is no way that you can uh, happily cycle along to a breast, chatting away and having a lovely outing without suddenly meeting a tractor coming in the opposite direction. There, there is no way we're going to be able to deliver on the vision for cycling. And I look particularly where we have put um, a cycle route in, for example, Litchfield. Um, as you drive into Litchfield from my side of the uh, constituency, um, yes, we've got a white line cycle way all the way in, and it is parked on by vehicles of people who live in the houses in front of the cycle way. If you were to uh, force them not to park on the cycle way, you would close the road because it's not wide enough to be able to pass if you leave the cycleway free. So I have a feeling that what we did was to tick boxes, but we didn't um, actually consider what the implications were of what we were doing. So I think, sadly, so much of Staffordshire is not going to be appropriate for um, cycleways, particularly on lanes. And I suppose if you look at them on major roads, I have to look back again to the poor man who's just been killed um, on the main road where he was quietly cycling along. So, um, hey-ho, I, I wish you luck. Thank you. Okay, any further comments or questions? No, again, we've got three recommendations. You've all read them. Are we happy with those recommendations? Uh, Thank you. Um, we'll move swiftly on. It's you again, David. <laughs> uh, let me just get my, let's see. It's the Highways Transformation Progress and Performance Quarterly Updates. David and team. <coughs> Thank you for the coffee, Ross, much appreciated. Yeah, I noticed you got one and no one else did. No? There's no such thing as a free lunch, David. No, no, I, I can imagine. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not going to go labour on because we have got a presentation. Obviously, members have been aware that we've been going through a highways transformation programme that we're working with our, our crews and our, and our members on. Um, to that end, that we have now signed the contract to extend with the annual review with Amy for the next five years, which is a real bonus for us because we've been able to maintain uh, the right the right relationships there, but also maintain the fact that 
uh, getting hold of materials and, and through Amy has been very, very useful. Um, I also have to say that with the transformation that things will be different both for members and for the way that we deliver highways. But I'm going to pass on to James to go through the, the presentation and then we're ready for any uh, questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, afternoon, committee. Um, yeah, I think this is the fourth of these uh, regular updates now uh, on the, the progress of the transformation programme. I'm hoping it will also be an opportunity to seek uh, some of the committee's input onto a couple of key uh, areas that are starting to emerge in the detail as we move forward. <coughs> so just a quick recap. Um, as I know you've heard a lot of this before, and I apologise, but um, I, I, although I'm kind of living and breathing this on most days, I'm mindful that we come back every sort of quarter and... Uh, uh, it's useful to just recap on some of this detail. So the transformation programme, as we know, is needed to deliver the, the change in strategy uh, that's linked to the County Council's new strategic plan, which is around fixing more roads and delivering excellent customer service in, in this uh, service area. It's a really large and complex programme. Um, it involves changes to the contracting and delivery arrangements that Councillor Williams has just referred to, uh, changes into working practices and additional investment as well, specifically into fixing more roads. Uh, so I'm going to just continue to run through on those key three themes, uh, which uh, hopefully uh, help uh, keep it all sort of tangible. Um, focusing on the delivery part, um, uh, sort of the big news headline, I suppose, the big progress since the last time I was here talking about this was uh, that last Friday, uh, the five-year contract extension with uh, the strategic partner, Amy, was finally completed. That's after nine months of hard work of... Uh, sorting out the commercial deal, deals and the, the changes to the contract type. And it's important to stress that, that although it's a contract extension, this is not clearly more of the same. Uh, this is, sorry, it's not more of the same. It's clearly, it's a very different way of working. It includes a whole new transformation bit around implementing what we call in this uh, mixed economy operating model, uh, which uh, this committee has committed, uh, contributed to the design of previously uh, and was approved by cabinet last July. Uh, and just to, again, recap on, on some of these things, you've seen this detail before, but this slide just illustrates that uh, the process of how that new operating model will work is we take that political direction and oversight from Cabinet or, uh, and from Select Committee and, and full Council and so on through the approval of uh, operating policies and the like. Uh, that new model involves establishing uh, what we call a bit of a fancy title, but a new uh, intelligent client function, which involves the additional capacity and capability to oversee, manage, control uh, those uh, delivery uh, models that sit beneath. So we already do that to an extent in different contract arrangements. So we've got things like the PFI uh, lighting contract. We've got things like uh, a different delivery model for the road safety partnership that we've just heard about. And then we've got all these functions that sit within the uh, existing partnership contract that we have with Amy. Uh, so even within there, starting off at that early point, there's probably going to be about 25 different sort of separate functions within that contract. Um, um, uh, although, as I say, it's a five-year deal, each one of those functions has no exclusivity or no guarantee around them. If performance isn't good enough within any of those any period within those five years, uh, or a new, better way emerges of doing things differently, perhaps through a new proprietary solution or a new emerging technology, then the council reserves the right to change that delivery arrangement for that particular function or group of functions as it needs to. So just hopefully trying to bring that alive a bit more. In terms of how that functional model operates, we see this as a this sort of high-level process here designed into kind of four key stages. So the first is setting out the annual requirements. Um, the second is developing a clear delivery plan, which is a key part for the, the provider, obviously, whether that's Amy or A and other. Um, executing the delivery, doing the right things in the right way to ensure we're getting the right quality, um, supported with the right communications and the like, and then the end of year delivery review, identifying the things that have gone well, things that could be better, what's the future improvement plan look like, whether that's because things could just be better or because there's new opportunities through new technologies and innovations. Uh, and there is a question towards the end of the presentation around uh, what the select committee's uh, role could be in that in the future. Um, about uh, supporting with the reviewing and sign off of those annual service plans. Moving on to the, the second part of the program. So we call this transforming our offer. Um, it's about really developing the new ways of working. Uh, and now that that contract extension task is complete, this current work stream that I'm about to talk about, to talk to now, and the 
uh, the sort of organization redesign the systems and processes to operate to, to, to transform our offer going forward will also merge into a lot of the act similar activity that's going on to take to implement that new functional delivery model that I've just been talking about so those work streams will start to trans sort of merge together uh, so in the future when I do these things I probably do it in two areas rather than three um, sorry just lost my place um, that's it uh, so the this slide just sort of tries to illustrate um, the sort of build up of different layers if you like of what uh, the transformed offer looks like so we're starting on the, of the base there the dark blue color with the solid foundations of our peer assessed highly efficient uh, very adaptable highway service uh, building up on the significant improvements in transparency of data and communication um, of activity and priorities that have been carried out implementing this new functional model providing greater transparency and assurance of operational performance around customer service quality value for money uh, a much much better customer offer uh, that's more responsive to community needs uh, better customer pathways and then aligning all that to a better member offer which there'll be there's more detail on this next slide again I, I i certainly can't read that from here i don't know if you can but you've, you've got the slide deck so hopefully you've been able to have opportunity beforehand to go through that detail um the summary of the of the, the planned uh, member improvement is is re basically the renewed aim at the top there which is to embed that member response capability within the service and when i say member response i don't necessarily just mean respond to a, you know a priority defects that might be out there but whether it's responding to inquiries good answers to questions whether whether it's um uh, support for enabling community capacity that type of thing but that readiness that capability that fleet of foot uh, that's required to support members in their day-to-day -day, uh, tasks and representing their communities uh, so it's broken down into four key themes on the left hand side and then 18 key deliverables uh, that we will be working through to review some of the things that we currently do now to implement new ways of working that might be new job roles new capacity within the team uh, new systems uh, and processes to enable all of that In terms of the high-level program, so working back from the contract extension go live on the 1st of October, which is on the, on the right-hand side, a lot of the work is associated with designing of job roles and, say, processes and systems over the next 12 months to implement that new functional operating model. Uh, we're hoping to get to a point where we'll be able to do a soft launch in April because that just ties in well with our financial years and gives us a bit of breathing space as we test and stress those systems, see how they're operating. Um, the focus over the next quarter is uh, really clarifying what the new key roles are within the, the partnership relationship uh, in terms of operating that new model and the new member offer as well, uh, where those responsibilities lie, uh, prioritizing the areas for redesign uh, across the partnership, uh, and which is a key part to enabling engagement with all the, the staff and the operatives that are involved in delivering that activity so that they have that sense of ownership and that supports the culture change uh, that we want as part of this program. Um, and all those improvements will come on board incrementally over the coming months. So it's not a matter of waiting until October 2024 for this to take effect. That is just a sort of contractual commercial arrangement. But these sort of in improvements will come on board incrementally uh, over the coming months. Uh, and they're just, this is just an indicative timeline. Uh, some of those dates possibly change as we get into the detail of uh, what and understand the scale and complexity of some of these tasks. But in the priority order there, we've got the member offer uh, over on the left-hand side, which is the, the key priority. Uh, core business service improvements, which we need for business continuity and fulfilling statutory functions. Um, new customer journey improvements. Uh, as I said, soft launch of the new operating model in April, and then the contract go live on the 1st of October 24. And then the final uh, piece <coughs> is the, the very sort of juicy uh, extra investment, which is... a critical part of the the, the transformation program uh, again i'm reminding you really of, of things that uh, you already know very well which the first part of the program was the 15 million pound cap extra capital investment provided uh, in july of last year um, that was mobilized very quickly uh, we've seen a lot of good progress including schemes like the complex a51 a518 junction at western successfully completed before christmas uh, and other works going on across across the county um, with some agreed roll forward as well, that's, uh, that program's going well. So we've got complex schemes like the A34 at Homecroft Structural Maintenance Scheme, which is a 10-month program. We could never have actually delivered that in years. So we've got the financial cover to, to roll that forward. So they're, they're all sort of green in terms of the status, even though it runs into the, the, new, the, the new financial year. Um, the repairing places pilot is just shown amber there because we did have a quite a bit of uh, 
difficulty at the start identifying suitable locations and places where we could carry out that work. So again, that work's rolled forward into next financial year, but the money's with it as well. Uh, so it's not a red status, it is still happening, it's just a bit later than we thought. And then there's the analysis and evaluation of what those uh, pilots have, have produced so that we can build them into the future ways of working where, where it's viable. Uh, and similarly, the customer service system is just amber there. There's a lot of design work going on in the background, engage with the customer services team and the digital team, uh, but actually any expenditure on improved systems won't happen in the current financial year, it will be in the next financial year. So it's just colored amber there for effect, but uh, um, that it's all agreed with the finance team uh, that, that, that uh, that's okay, the money's in place for it still. So it's not at risk. Uh, and then in parallel with the capital uh, funding, we also had two million pound revenue funding. This was largely about extra capacity to drive through the transformation program and support the sort of interim changes around enhanced uh, quality assurance and the like. We always knew uh, with the money not being confirmed until July last year that we were really going to struggle to uh, sort of identify uh, suitable candidates, recruit uh, and actually spend that money within, within last financial year. So. Uh, we made a commitment about, at the time, I think a sort of 50-50 split. So we hoped to get to about a million pound in, in capacity, uh, but that hasn't been achieved. It's about, it'll be about just over half a million pound, hence the amber. Uh, but what that has meant is that the remaining just under one and a half million uh, revenue funding has been able to be uh, reallocated to operational work on the ground, uh, which is very good for, for local communities and those local priorities that need doing, um, need addressing, and they, they're progressing really well. I do just put, you know, sort of uh, a uh, appreciation to the team though as well. So with that finite existing capacity, it's extra work to deliver. Uh, and then looking, oh, is it moving? Oh, there we go. Uh, looking forward to the new financial year. Uh, last week, Cabinet announced the uh, new 23-24 Highways and Transport Capital Program. So that's the full suite of uh, maintenance, bridge works, uh, integrated improvements and developer uh, schemes that are in that programme, focusing just on the maintenance and the extra investment. Whilst we know the grant funding that comes from central government does remain a huge challenge, uh, the Cabinet's commitment is for an extra £30 million to be invested in fixing more roads over the next two years. So it's not necessarily 15 and 15, but it's £30 million over two years to give us some flexibility uh, around road space booking and the logistics of getting that work designed and delivered. Um, and that's together with continuation of the two million extra revenue funding as well um, for the extra organisational capacity. And again, like last year, um, there will be some residual funding available uh, there that won't get spent necessarily on officer capacity, but will enable us to uh, deliver a number of areas uh, of improvements or, or continuing revenue activity, which uh, I think some details on a, on a further slide in a moment. There's a couple of points as well that just highlighting at the uh, bottom of that slide there as well, which I think are important to note, particularly around the footway preventative uh, treatments program, that due to the amount of uh, digital infrastructure upgrades that are taking place at the moment, we've got an agreement I think, to postpone that activity so that to not to prove abortive. So we will still maintain safety inspections and do reactive maintenance to keep them safe, but we won't engage in the sort of full scale preventative surface treatments or reconstructions resurfacing on the footways, just because of the risks involved of it getting uh, dug up again. Uh, and likewise, the, the Chetwin Bridge is uh, an important thing to, to just highlight there, such a you know, uh, landmark location uh, on one of the important approaches to the National Memorial Arboretum. Um, and it has got a, uh, a weight restriction implemented on it at the moment because of its, uh, its uh, condition. Um, uh, and there is some funding being allocated to get ourselves fund a shovel ready, if you like, for future funding opportunities for a, an, alternative, uh, fee an alternative structure. Uh, the detail, I didn't intend to go through all this, but the, the details of how that funding has, has been spent is contained in these slides, which hopefully you've had a chance to peruse. Um, so on the, the capital structure maintenance, the preventative maintenance, we've got flooding and drainage priorities there and minor capital maintenance. When these slides were produced, obviously we, we weren't aware of the uh, Chancellor's announcement. Uh, it was uh, another good news story last week with the 200 million pound national uh, pothole repair fund of which uh, Staffordshire share is 4.56 million, I think. Um, so there was work going on now to work out the detail of what that will look like uh, as part of uh, our delivery program for next year. Um, 
that's the, the revenue slide. So some of that residual revenue funding for next year is being allocated to some key priorities, which is just feedback we've had from members over the last year or two, really, um, following some earlier MTFS savings. So uh, reinvested in grass cutting, we moved to six urban grass cuts last year. That causes quite a lot of problems around maintaining quality uh, during difficult growing seasons. Uh, we've got additional weed control uh, as a, an extra one as well. We found going down to one weed treatment, as we suspected, was probably going to be largely uh, ineffective. So reintroducing the two additional weed sprays. So we've got three, a cycle of three this year, hopefully a lot more effective. Um, uh, and, and just some other en enhancements there, which, uh, oh, sorry, the, the environmental one there, I think around the uh, three-tier working pilot is quite important as well. There's been some really good successes there, particularly in South Staffordshire. Uh, where we've had uh, sort of 50-50 leverage, I think, and contributions there from the district council as well, uh, doing combining street scene and, and highway activities to, to sort of maximum benefit. So we'll continue with those pilots of work to, again, inform future ways of working. And then really just two last things uh, to, to mention, really, I think, on the innovation, uh, sorry, on the investment side. Uh, the first is around Innovation Hub. So following the successes of uh, Staffordshire's Live Lab 1, which we had with the... Uh, under the DFT and ADEPT scheme a few years ago. Uh, you remember, we, we want to use that as a launch pad. That what was really successful about that was not necessarily the individual pilot work that we did, the innovations. It was more the infrastructure that we set up. So that's the county council's highways team working with uh, local academia, um, uh, local S well, SMEs and supply chain uh, industry partners as well to identify key problems affecting the sector develop or identify, develop solutions and potentially try to upscale those solutions for, for wider national coverage, uh, potentially with uh, some sort of uh, commercial benefit on the back of that as well, uh, potentially for the county council as well as for the providers. Uh, we want to replicate that uh, through as an ongoing piece of work. So once now the ADEPT thing's gone, still create that, recreate that uh, in Staffordshire uh, as an innovation hub. Um, and in parallel, we also want to continue to, well, we will continue to test and pilot uh, and evaluate a whole wide range of new emerging technologies and uh, repair techniques that uh, come about uh, day to day. Um, and we could potentially include in our future armory. Uh, and then the last piece is around communication. We hear this all the time, that uh, as good as we can possibly be, uh, all the peer reviews and all that type of activity can be great. You know, it's... Uh, our performance information can say that, but we're only as good as what people perceive us to be. And that's a big ambition of the transformation program that we want not only the people within the service, but the members we support and the, the communities that you represent uh, to be uh, you know, advocates of the service. And, and everyone feels that uh, it, it's uh, achieving what it's set out to achieve. And I think to that communication is, is absolutely critical. So as part of the extra investment, <coughs> we're really stressing on the communication side about being very clear uh, advanced notification of what those planned programs uh, and projects of work are, active updates throughout their delivery, and then the consequential wash-up uh, and completion to see the, the local benefit for the community that's been achieved as a result of that investment. Uh, and then I think that takes me to that side of slide, the final slide, which is just repeating those uh, those two questions. If, uh, if the chair and committee are minded to consider them, that would be, be really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, I think the role for the select committee is um, that when we when we started this journey, um, David ran a members seminar to go through where we wanted to be, what it was going to look like, and how we could how we could make that difference. And I think that gave a lot of members a better insight into what the transformation was all about. And I think that's where we need to be. Because we can sit in a room as a, as a committee and we can, in my division, in my, and, but, but we don't actually get down to the crux of what we want to do. So my comment back to you guys is get another member seminar up and running and we can actually look at what we think the level of service agreement should be. Um, because I think you get more out of people if all members are involved rather than just us eight or ten people here um, and also if, if members feel like they've had an input into it they're more likely to take it out to the communities so I think that works massively um, those people that don't attend the seminar for whatever reason if they've got a good reason then fine but those that just sit and shout about it because they couldn't be bothered so be it you're always going to have that one um, and then the planned improvements to deliver 
Um, I just want to know, when we go on about the customer journey, because the biggest complaint <coughs> that most of us have, I'm guessing, is, oh, well, I can't, I can't do it on my staff's app because the my staff's app's down most of the time. Every time I go on it, I can never get on it. So I just go onto the onto web and just do it when I get home. And then sometimes you can't always have the photographs because the photographs are too big and then you have to try and reduce the size. And a lot of people can't do that when they're just out in the community trying to help us. So less clunky, more simple is the way forward when it comes to the customer journey, I think. Um, David. Chairman, looking at the two questions for the select committee, um, I would suggest that um, the only way that members can scrutinise the work of uh, the uh, cabinet or the officers is through a scrutiny panel. Whether that's the best vehicle for scrutinising them and the best way for the uh, members to work is a debate for another time. But for us not to scrutinise uh, what we've been brought today would be a scandal and I don't think that that's something that's even worth discussing. Uh, it's a member decision how we scrutinise the work that is done by yeah, the cabinet member and their team. I would just raise a few questions. Um, are we satisfied with Amy? Because if you were to raise this question in a meeting of full council, you could talk mm -hmm. yourself into the ground with the dissatisfaction that members have with the performance of Amy. So I would question um, two things really. One, are we satisfied with Amy? Or two, is the brief that Amy has so tight that it doesn't allow them to do the job more effectively? Um, I think particularly that many of us have come up with the problem where a pothole has been reported and the pothole has been filled quite correctly, but there is a pothole next to it where Amy have not got instructions to do anything about it. So do we need to change the brief that Amy have? Because that presumably will affect the funding, but it will reduce the cost of going back again and doing it all over again. I'd also, in the point that's just been raised about ditches and landowners' liability, um, if the landowner declines to do something, and I have a particular problem in my division, and so the yeah, county have to step in and do something that the landowner has declined to do, our process then would be to send a bill to the landowner for his failure to fulfil his obligation. If he refuses to pay that bill, we would then take a charge on his property, which probably would mean... Councillor Smith, can we bring it back to what we're discussing today? Well, I'm well it is actually in the report. Well, it isn't... It isn't you're, you're talking about well, your I've division. Well, I've finished now. Okay. I, I would be bring interested it, to know... Bring it back to what we're talking about today. How we would recover that money once we've done it. So I would take the point that was in the report. Graham. Um, thanks. Uh, I, I think this is a really excellent report built on uh, what we all input into earlier. I think this is exactly what we wanted to see. And I do notice that you've put more money in for trees. Thank you very much. Uh, nod to me. Uh, I, I think there's, there's two points. First of all, Chair, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, Sometime in perhaps September, October, maybe uh, even November, perhaps we could have a workshop for everybody and to make sure that all the councillors, not just this glorious committee, um, are on board. We, we've had our input and we've seen the results of that input. You've listened, you've come back, and you've pretty much delivered exactly what we wanted. We wanted a new working model to pick up on Councillor Smith's viewpoint, and that's what you're giving us, this hybrid model, um, and that's exactly what we suggested, and that's what you're delivering, and I think that ought to um, do things. Coming back to 
should things come back to us? Well, after the workshop, and perhaps early next year, I would actually like to see in this committee how it's all gone. And, and, and for us to be able to look at how it's gone, what lessons have you learned that you can share with us that we can actually say, oh, that's good, next, when, when education come here or some health come here, <laughs> we'll remember that. That's a, but that it, because transform the whole point of a transformation program is that uh, you set out on a journey, and it's a journey, and you're never quite sure what's going to work best and what's going to work worse. And I spent 10 years in doing transformation uh, in major government departments. And, you know, sometimes you think, well, I didn't expect to get here, but actually it's not bad. Uh, you know, uh, so when it's, some of it, it has to be suck it and see, and you have to monitor that. And I think uh, for Prosperous, uh, for the Pros Prosperous Overview Committee and Scrutiny Committee, I think the biggest thing for us is see, looking at that journey and whether you, you've met the targets that you've set yourselves and the lessons that can be learned because uh, we see everybody and th those lessons could be applied somewhere else. That's it. Thank you very much, Chair. Philip. I really want this to work, David, because at the moment, um, yeah. if you talk to your residents, they've got no faith in Amy and no faith in what's going on. So I'm really looking forward to the positive things that we're going to hear. The member offer planned improvements is a superb way forward. How is it going to work and how can we get access to um, you know, the, what's going on? Because at the moment we can't because we need too many licenses for the software. So I want the ability to, when they've been on my staff's app and they've got that number and it's been reported and then nothing's happened for two or three months, I need to be able to access that code, see what's going on and then say, right, you know, we need to up the plan here. Because, yeah, um, because in the past, I mean, recently we've had jobs where there was a clear um, health and safety issue outside a pub where there's a trip hazard that was reported and it took over a week for somebody to go out and have a look at it. Meanwhile, people are saying, oh, I could have tripped on that, you know, it, and it was done, but it took Amy over a week to go and see a clear, even when we sent photographs in saying, look at this trip hazard, if somebody falls over that, it's gonna cost us a bit of money. And then there's other things where there are clear, there might have not been a category one pothole at one stage, but because they still haven't done anything on something for three to four months, it's now getting deeper and deeper. Uh, you know, which we report, Trevor Mellor ups it, never gets done. And, you know, meanwhile, the public are criticising me and I can't do any more. I've done as much as I can. I mean, thankfully, we've got, hopefully, got one repaired this afternoon, David, which is a different one altogether, where um, it was a, went out, was inspected. They said it's not in the driving line, uh, so it's not a priority. We're now nearly in Australia with that one. So, you know, uh, thankfully to the Cabinet member, he has helped me on that. And hopefully when I get home, it's been repaired because it hadn't when I came out this afternoon. But the member offer planned improvements is going to stop all that, hopefully, because we're the local people. We know our roads and we can say, I think you're wrong on that one. I might not be a structural engineer, but, you know, I know my roads well. So I really look forward to that. And that's why we need to come back as a school committee in perhaps six months, 12 months and say, right, how's it gone? And, uh, you know, and I... And, I think some of the repairs have got better. Um, yeah, some were not too good. I think the standard of the repairs has got better, particularly, you know, where, where I've asked. But the member offer planned improvements is, I think, the key stage forward here, and that's going to make or break us, and we need to keep an eye on that. Thank you, Chair. Ross. Yeah, <coughs> sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure I can shoe on this into the two questions that you've given us, but I'll, um, I have got a, co a couple of comments and questions that, that may not necessarily fall directly, but anyway. Um, first of all, I think this is a great opportunity. I think it's great. I think it's really good that we've had a look at this and that the hybrid model, and I hope in 12 months' time we'll all sit around this table, all smiles, and we'll see a massive improvement in delivery, and I'm confident that it will. Um, one thing that does deeply concern me that's, that's mentioned in, the, in, in there, and I, I completely understand the logic behind it, is this pause to the, the treatment of, 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 of footways. 
I understand the logic behind it. What worries me is another two-year delay on, an, on a piece of infrastructure across the county which is already deteriorating. It's going to push everything back a couple of years. So is there going to be some kind of a programme to try and pick this back up again? Bear in mind, in two years' time, this infrastructure is still going to be installing. And is there not an initiative an, an or collaborative way of working with these organisations to overlay, I know, I know it's our programme works against theirs, to not, not necessarily follow them behind, but it seems strange that a footpath which is due to be repaired and then has... Um, uh, a digital infrastructure put in next week and then has to wait for two years before we come and actually do the repairs. You know, to me, the common sense is there's an opportunity to carry on with those works, not necessarily pause it, but to work smarter. And then just on another slightly different subject, within the new contract, uh, this is Prosperous Staffordshire. We're looking to engage with Staffordshire businesses. Does the new contract allow and encourage engagement with local contractors to get them to deliver some of these works? I'm hoping it is, and I'm sure it will. I'd like some insurance to that. If so, what is that mechanism? How do people get in there? How do our businesses get in and engage with Amy? And finally, what protections are we as a county council putting in place to protect that relationship between Amy and their subcontractors to make sure it's fair and equitable? Because Amy's a multi-billion pound organisation. If they're working with a team, a, a small business of five or ten individuals, it's really important that when we get the performance management right, so the quality is right, but also that we protect that business in terms of the payment terms and that just that that relationship is fair and equitable and we're protecting all, all people within that supply chain network. Thank you. <coughs> thank, thank you for all those questions. Uh, yeah, <coughs> I, I, I completely understand the Amy satisfaction part and it was something that when I was a backbencher, it was something, that, as, as members will be aware, it was something I used to take up quite regularly. I think there's a lot of a perception issue, uh, and there's also an action issue about what, we, what they were originally designed to do. So basically, uh, is it 10 years ago now that the, the council went on to Amy, basically said, here's the money, do as much as you can, and that is exactly what they got. The change that we've made, or, and, and especially myself, is we're, what we're doing from a member point of view and from a new council point of view is not do every, as much as you can, it's what, do what we want as members, do what the public want from what they're sending in on their complaints. And looking at how we can make the best use of our, our, our um, money uh, and make sure that we are doing the right areas first. So it, this is why this is, a, a, I know it's the most ridiculous point, member-centric approach. And this is going to be really key. There's going to be a complete change when you go in to see your community highways teams. Um, it won't just be for your DHPs, hopefully. You'll be working with them on a more regular basis. You'll be able to be talking to them about where your priorities are not just DHP priorities, but what are the issues that you're getting from your communities. The people who are community highways managers are very well uh, educated and trained in this, and they can prioritise it. And the biggest difference now will be that they will be working much closer with the schedulers, and they will be able to move things and tell, tell the schedulers to move things around. That doesn't mean it's the most, effective, the most efficient financially, but it does mean we get the things done as we want. And I think you will have seen from the trials that we've been carrying out over the last year, that has changed already. Um, so it, it really is a, a complete change. And I, I get the fact that there are issues with getting hold of some information, but actually the, um, the Citrix top part where you can have a look at what defects you've got when they're reported, when they're being... Um, repaired, where you've got your gullies and, 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 the, and the lists on that. That is a lot. And actually, um, I've got one. I was allowed to have some of the uh, extra information and the amount of time it takes to download from prop really good Wi-Fi, and not, that's not mine at home, uh, is really a long time. So I have to say that I wouldn't really want to put that information out, but you can get that from your community highways teams. You can get that now. There is no waiting around. If you want to know when, when, you, when anything you've got is coming in your area, you can get that information from your highways teams now. And actually, you can discuss with them your priorities, same with the other members will in that area, and, but it will be down to the managers to be able to say, these are the priorities and this is the order. If that's going to be really key because they will know it. And remembering that we also have to do work with regards to outside um, areas, so there are some times where the actual highway can be blocked up in, say, Derbyshire, which is why you can't do something in Burton or, or same with your Toxeter. Um, because what we're also trying to do is remove, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, and that sort of maintaining a through flow of vehicles is better than them sitting there idling away. So that's something that we do ought to do. 
The workshop part, we are looking to do an annual workshop and we're also trying to look at doing a quarterly input and update for every single member. So that will mean that where we go with the transformation, what we're doing, what we've achieved, that will be coming to you quarterly. And then the annual workshop will to remind you of what things are, how things are working, uh, what the actual challenges are that we're facing out there. Um, those who know about Shobna Road in Burton will know there have been several challenges on that stretch. So I, I think it's something that's really important and that is now being put into place both with myself and with the comms team so that you'll have more information and you'll be able to share that properly so we're putting it into the right format so that you'll be able to share it with your communities and your social media. Um, and that's got to be key really where the, diff the big difference about being, in my opinion, about being member centric is some of the work's going to be down to members. Some of the work is going to be down to you going in and speaking with your crew to your teams and then identifying what where you've reported and, and actually promoting when we've done that work because it's really important to get rid of the perception that we've actually done something. So I went to Broad Lane where we've done a, 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 ma a major route in Broad Lane, Essington, and it looks absolutely fantastic. I cannot tell you how good it looks. I've actually had, we've had, actually had complaints of people wanting uh, the uh, complaining about the fact that the road looks so good it means that people are speeding. Uh, uh, and people wanting the uh, the speed dumps hired up so that they, you know wanting them to stop HGVs and all that. But actually, this piece of work I have to say that we did this year from this funding is really going well. And this is another one of these ones where I'll, I'll, I'll promote this and start to start the phone, lead by example, as they always say. Um, but this one is a really great piece of work, and this is what we're trying to do. So, the promotion of this to change the. Um, perception from the public is something that's got to be really key. I have to say, though, tempering that with the fact that we will never, ever get rid of potholes. Potholes are made by water. Vehicles go in over and push the water in, and that's how it happens. Remembering that the more electric vehicles that we'll have, they are heavier than normal cars. They will push water in quicker. This is something that we're having to factor into our works. Um, when it comes to also with, with information, we are going to have a dedicated part of a website. So that information, there will be more information easily, made, easily obtained and members will be able to do that. So that's something that's really going to be key. Um, I, just from Ross's point on the, on the pathways, unfortunately, I would love to say they'd be collaborative. They aren't. They're not collaborating with us, but they're also not collaborating with themselves. We now have one, seven, 17 fibre companies coming in over the next two years. Uh, none of them are going to use the same bit, none of them are going to use the same trunk, they're all literally ripping it up and unfortunately the legal part says I can't stop them due to whatever. So that's the reason why we're suspending it and actually where we have had, where we've done slurry seals, uh, which as you know the moment we cut through a slurry seal with, when they put the fibre in it, the surface is useless. We've also had complaints that we've been out, done these lovely pathways and then they've come along and dug them up. So I, get, I do understand your point, but what we are saying is that where they are um, deteriorating to the point where we've got where it needs it, we will patch those for safety, but there is literally very little point in doing anything else. It'd be lovely if the government changed the, the rules that when they came through with the fibre, that they had to do the whole path at once, go on, go. That'd be, that'd be very nice, but they don't. Um, and we only get two years, remember, two years guarantee when they do it for the work. So it's something that's... Um, I understand where you're coming from, but unfortunately, that's the reason why we, we took that decision. Um, when it comes to local contractors, yes, we are wanting to use more local contractors. We are trying to make it in the fairest and possible way, but we will have to have some assurances because at the end of the day, we need to know that the work that they carry out is good, which is why we brought our, our uh, inspectors back in-house and they will be out going out to checking on the work that's being carried out. Um, if I'm going to be honest with you, the whole of this transformation for me is really exciting. The way that things are moving at a pace now is also really exciting, and we are now into the real delivery stage. One of the things that's missing on air, we've got nearly £20 million on the Luff bid as well, which also includes b b b cycling routes, buses, but also a lot of money that's going into separate routes coming into you know, to Stafford, Cannock, Burton, and the, on the uh, A38 with the New Branson Interchange. Huge amounts of work going on. We've just been fortunate enough to have another million and a half pound in cycle routes from different funding on two areas. So realistically, we are doing very well. 
Uh, we're making sure that we're not over, overdoing it in the fact that we've got the capacity and to be able to enforce these uh, and, and provide these. But at the same time, we're making sure that we're working with AB to actually get the right thing. And that's why uh, when you go out there, you'll be able to see that. And I'm hoping that the new rebranding that's coming on uh, as of April, that the, the way that the teams are working uh, and that... Um, the way that you'll be seen. So obviously when you go out there and you're working with that with our comms teams, you might get some a nice one of those jackets on to make sure you're safe while you're standing on the path and have a photo. Um, all these sort of things are really going to be positives out there. And I think that is part of the way. I know there's a national picture with potholes, but at the end of the day, as long as we're doing what we can, and we are, as I say, when we're looking at the fact that we've just had four and a half million extra, We've already started planning exactly what we're going to do with that, and I think you'll be very happy with that as members. Um, I think that will be really positive again, and it, it really is. The, the gateway works that are going on are really good. So I have to say, uh, I, I'm excited with it. I am. I, I know I've got loads of ideas and keep on doing it. Uh, but we're also working over several portfolios, which also includes the, uh, the um, carbon reduction. So, um, yeah, really happy with this, Chairman. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? David, is it quick? Yes. And it's not about your division. Can I just keep the record straight that my second question related to page 134 of the report? I don't wish to pursue that. Okay. Everyone happy with uh, what James has delivered in the slideshows? Okay, thank you, James and David. I think you can go now, David. I think you're free. And we'll move, um, move on to the work programme, which I believe is next. About... Can you put your microphone on? I, I didn't, really didn't want to interrupt that because I thought it was so informative. But there are other people who look to highways, but major highways. And unfortunately, Highways England in South Staffordshire, they want to build uh, a link road from the M6 to the M54 Junction 1. That's been ongoing now for <laughs> quite a few years. The problem is we cannot get information of when it will start. It was supposed to start well over 12 months ago. But unfortunately, because of what they do not tell us, we haven't a clue when that is going to start. And I think that that is also creating problems for our own highways department on, on some of the areas around where it's going to start, either end of, of that particular link road. So... We as a committee, I was wondering whether or not we can make contact with Highways England and receive information to add to our own highways whereby we know what's going on. Because at the moment, in South Staffordshire, we haven't a clue what's going on about that particular road. You know, you have little words whereby it said there's no money or, you know, they have found something on the route that shouldn't be there, various things. But you have no body from Highways England who's passing all that information on if it's true. But I do think we as the County Council, we should be part of the knowledge of Highways England of what is happening in Staffordshire. That, that's really what I wanted to say, Chairman. Um, James Darrell, is that something that you could take up and then get back to Bernard and perhaps send us all a note on what happens? Yeah, yeah, we can do both. We can we can chase up on that specific issue, um, but we can also um, have a conversation with them because we try and build a relationship with them as well um, around uh, perhaps coming to a future committee to talk about how they work, how they operate, how they try to liaise with local highways authorities, not just us, others, um, and a chance for the committee to ask them questions. I think it would be useful. Thank you. Okay, Bernard, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to the, um, you can go, definitely go now, gents. <coughs> um, work programme, Jonathan. Um, uh, uh, 
just to let the committee know, there have actually been three changes or potential changes to the work programme since the report was published. I don't know whether you want to refer to those, Chairman, or... Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right, um, you're expecting a report on tree planting net zero by nature uh, to your April meeting. Uh, we've been contacted by the Cabinet member to say that there's uh, a delay in uh, publication of a report that's been commissioned from external consultants. When that report's received, it actually needs to be considered by informal Cabinet prior to coming to scrutiny. So the timeline now, or the expected timeline um, for that, is late summer 2023. So with the approval of the Chairman, we can cross that off the the work programme for next time. <coughs> uh, also, um, there's a potential new item um, that the Cabinet member isn't entirely sure whether it's likely to be next time or uh, the 2nd of June meeting uh, on traffic and network management plan. So with your approval, Chairman, we can add that to next time and then if close to the time it looks as though it's going to be delayed, we can put it down for June. And uh, the final one, uh, we've had a request from Cabinet Member for Education and SEND to consider um, a, an item on the review of residential overnight education uh, at your June meeting. So with your approval, Chairman, I can have that to to your work programme. And that's it. So on the April meeting, we've still got local flood risk management strategy and we've still got household waste recycling centres. Okay, so we're just taking off the tree planting net zero. Yes, and obviously potentially there's the item um, traffic and network traffic and management. Traffic network management plan. might go on. Yeah. Okay, I think that's everything for the next meeting, which is... Um, 27th of April at 10 o'clock, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> I like morning meetings. Um, so if there's nothing else, I'll um, close the meeting and thank you very much for your attendance today. Thank you very much.